front matter to the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson front matter to my many valued friends among the citizens of norwich i dedicate this little volume our intellectual and active powers increase with our affection the scholar sits down to write and all his years of meditation do not furnish him with one good thought or happy expression but it is necessary to write a letter to a friend and forthwith troops of gentle thoughts invest themselves on every hand with chosen words by ralph waldo emerson i am startled that god can make me so rich even with my own cheap stores it needs but a few wisps of straw in the sun some small word dropped or that has lain long silent in some book when heaven begins and the dead arise no trumpet is blown perhaps the south wind will blow by thoreau foreword the handsome welcome given to my little book through broadland in a braden punt has emboldened me to offer to the public an account of my latest trip in a clumsy small sea-boat on the pleasant waterways of broadland short notes were kept of each day's adventures which were not of a very exciting character but were nevertheless made enjoyable by the leisurely way in which the walrus crept up and downstream due largely to a lack of favourable winds and frequently none at all the temperature was rarely summer-like the grey skies were so constant that the freshness of the atmosphere much atoned for a want of sunshine the conversion of the walrus into a cabined boat was an experiment inasmuch as the venture was an attempt to show how a small craft could be cheaply and easily transformed into a yacht but the experiment was unsuccessful it would have been much better had i placed myself in the hands of my friend blake of yachting renown and had hired a ready-made article however i was owner and commander and like the wind which bloweth where it listeth so did i signed arthur henry patterson also known as john no little ibis house great yarmouth introduction some little time ago when mr arthur h patterson self-styled john no little but better known to his friends as john Noalot, wrote his through broadland in a braden punt the late mr christopher davies who was practically the discoverer of the norfolk broads wrote a very kindly and amusing preface to it now that john no little is issuing the present work i have great pleasure in following the lead of our common instructor and writing a few words of appreciation of it mr patterson's work is always thorough and genuine and reliable and is the result of much keen observation savoured with much humour a very rare and readable mixture he has taken up a line of his own 
and his many readers enjoy him and his methods for they feel he is saying just what he feels in his own devil-may-care way which i share with him myself and one which i think pays in the long run if he has a fault it is in his fatal failing for covering his envelopes with highly amusing sketches a habit which interferes with the regular postal service for they are so greatly enjoyed in transitu sorters and postmen alike that they are often delayed in transmission seriously speaking he is a power in norfolk not only for the humorous side of his character but for the extreme correctness and reliability of his scientific observations and i trust he may last long simultaneously instructing and amusing us for his writings have driven as many into the pleasant paths of natural history as he has into the board schools signed walter rye end of front matter chapter one of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain the passing of the crocus so he ordered the carpenter of his ship to build a little stateroom or cabin in the middle of the longboat with a place to stand behind it to steer and haul home the main sheet and work the sails a table to eat on with some lockers to put in some bottles and particularly his rice bread and coffee a quotation from robinson crusoe robinson crusoe is my patron saint from childhood the book of his adventures has fascinated me and fired my imagination it is the best thumb book in my library to-day in fancy i went to sea with crusoe at hull and tramped the sand-hills from winterton to yarmouth with the crew after that terrible storm wherein his ship had foundered we went together to the brazils thence designing to stretch over for the african coast but found ourselves cast ashore on the caribbean island the rest of the crew being drowned i have been in the moor's longboat with crusoe and zuri the faithful and again and often in the little periagua that he had hatchet fashioned out of a tree in which short voyages were made round about the island no wonder then that the placid broadland waters have a charm for me and the wilder expanse of braden allures i have wondered whether a boy chooses his reading by an instinct or whether his mind becomes biased through a book by accident says thoreau it is not all books that are as dull as their readers how many a man has dated a new era in his life from the reading of a book a written word is the choicest of relics it is something at once more intimate with us and more universal than any other work of art it is the work of art nearest to life itself crusoe then and gilbert white and thomas edward the shoemaker naturalist of banff and lubbock of norfolk fauna fame have influenced and moulded one boy's life and christopher davies swan and her crew confirmed it 
my designs have never been towards owning a bona fide yacht but rather to small craft that take up scant sea room with a minimum of raffle and trouble the moor's longboat with the shoulder of mutton sail and the cabin amidships was my ideal there's an old catcher's ship's boat as i think will suit you in the customs yard said a man in a brass buttoned uniform go in the long room and put in a price for her she'll be going cheap so early in june nineteen twenty two i went and viewed her she looked a beauty without paint a sorry craft clad in many coats of tar with strakes gaping with rifts but without a solitary broken timber or rib i went as directed and made the handsome offer of two pounds for the boat thinking it ridiculous to offer less and on june the twentieth there came a note from his majesty's custom house ordering me to take her away at once at that price her parent ship the coal ketch crocus had foundered somewhere off haysborough and the derelict boat found wallowing at sea was handed over to the customs the owners probably thinking her not worth the salvage money demanded she was fourteen feet long with a beam of five feet three inches drawing when picked up possibly a couple of tons of salt water through many a bad seam and but a few inches when finally made ready for cabining in then my logging began june the twenty fourth three of us self chico drain a trusty old waterman and my son-in-law a bit of a water spaniel himself ran the old hull her rifts having been roughly plugged with tow and putty on rollers across the quay to the crane chico hooked the slings to stem and stern post ringles and jumped aboard being hoisted in her and going over the quayside with her on hitting the surface full fifty water jets squirted upwards and she quickly began to fill before we had gone a hundred yards towards the haven bridge my pilot was astride the thwarts bailing her out with a bucket to continue this hardly expected exercise until the punt yarwhelp had towed her abreast of my braden shed to fill on the slipway rollers as she would or leak it out again as the tide fell hoping she like a sensible thing would take up and so staunch her sun-made and storm-strain wounds june the twenty fifth sunday chico had offered to take the boat to my st olive's cutting by this morning's flood tide so having bailed her out at seven she was made fast to drain's ancient shrimp boat scarce larger than her tow and at half past we had her afloat and heading for braden bridge well knowing that round the point we should have a stormy reception from the fierce west-south-west breeze a blowing straight down channel dead ahead of us the flood had already begun to run strongly so that a seething array of white-topped waves came sweeping along at us like a pack of foaming wolves we'll hit attack the whole bloomin way said my firm-jawed boatman as he resolutely began manipulating the jib-sheet now hitching it to a thole on the port side and now on the starboard one leaving the main sheet fast for the mainsail to fill itself at every tack and look after itself 
which it did bravely two tacks were made to reach every stake some fifty-six on either side of the channel all told when not scarred out or ice broken meantime the old crocus the name still legible in yellow paint on the stern was walloping and slushing about and constantly becoming less manageable and floatable as the water within her increased and logged her and when passing stake sixteen the double coir tow-rope parted with the chuck and the strain when the twice-made derelict drove back homewards as if she had had enough of it forced by the wind against the romping tide twice did we tack ere we could overtake the runaway when i caught her by the gunwale with the boat-hook and a stout hempen rope was made fast to her when i jumped in to bail her fortunately i was still aboard her whether chico's boat would have missed stays had i then been in the y h two one o and no frap happened i am unable to say but certain it is she did healing so badly that i saw her keel as the lee gunwale lapped up a cataract of water from a big roller chico did not lose his head he never does and in an instant fell flat on his belly and reached out for the weather rail hauling his weight up the almost perpendicular incline to it and the boat as if also knowing what she too should do slowly it seemed to me very slowly indeed paid off until the jib snapped and cracked as she ran into the wind then filled as my admiral seized the tiller and the mainsail jibed smartly to its duties had i been sitting at the crucial moment upon the lars or mast footcleats as i had been a few minutes before i have little doubt that y h two one o would have jonahed me keep out of the men's boat said chico to the tumbling waters with a chuckle of triumph a saying he tells me that is commonplace with fishermen who sail on rough seas for a second time before Braden was cleared had i to haul the boat in and clamber aboard to lighten her of water for the weight seriously told upon our speed and yet a third time when halfway up the waveney to st olives my perch upon the lars was not a pleasant one for the tow-boat shipped many a head of spray which smothered my shoulders the sky was exceeding wild with heavy grey clouds that imparted to the waters the same dull drab tints but for that busy old patch jibsail we had not got over Braden at all when nearing the narrows close to borough castle there was encountered a far less boisterous sea for all the crocuses labouring and lurching the walls slightly broke the force of the wind through these troubled waters sped a mother shelled duck with neck outstretched and gaping bill chortling instructions to a striped downy family of four ducklings whose speedful swimming was truly surprising quite equalling their heavy appearance efforts they were wholly incapable of flying and she would not rise instead they paddled lustily making the surface boil in a wake behind them with the vigorous strokes of their webbed feet the old male flew in circles around them much agitated voicing instructions and warnings given freedom from molestation by heartless gunners this remarkably handsome fowl 
would become a real and appropriate ornament to our waterways this year they nested in peace three or four pairs of them on the uplands not a great way from my houseboat at st olive's and to my knowledge clutches of four seven and nine were hatched off the youngsters are early led from their rabbit burrow homes and escorted to water and do not leave the waterside again even ducklings hatched in confinement have the same instinct for flitting at the earliest opportunity they may be kept in captivity without trouble and will become so tame as to feed from one's hand and will patter their flat feet upon the soil as plovers do to frighten the worms to the surface the shelled duck as a rule is execrable upon the table as are all carnivorous ducks i tried one as an experiment the verdict being never again from an economic standpoint the bird is worthless but it is a beautiful creature and anything that adds to a beautifying of this world can ill be spared the big tide had swept the gulls off the flats to shelter and rest on the marshes the turns were few and kept to the neighbourhood of the ditches as did the herons who prefer hunting for voles upon the marshes on such days to trying pot's luck in angry waters the only yacht we passed and none passed us was lying at the mouth of the norwich river idling the crew having had an uncomfortable night upon the mud and were waiting for the ebb and smoother water to make it we reached st olive's at twelve thirty when drain left me at the bridge himself getting off back in a fifth of the time that covered the upbringing the day continued squally and when making for my cutting with the crocus half full of water a tremendous gust of wind pushed us into the reeds and a heavy downpour of rain soaked me to the skin before i could round the corner then the sun broke out as if apologising for his long absence and very soon dried my togs indeed doing it thoroughly whilst i ate my dinner in the houseboat moorhen the second for some days the boat was allowed to fill and empty herself as the tides rose and fell and give an opportunity to staunch her wounds july the eighth hauled the boat upon the bank beside the cutting scraped her inside and out and tightened up the stem and stern with galvanized wire nails july the ninth elijah plain a burly fellow clad against the incessant rain in his old khaki overcoat with its bullet punches in the tails and another fronting his heart where a german bullet smashed his razor and so as he said seft his life in the midst of the deluge the boat was tilted on her side with keel to winnard so that the strakes could be tightened with copper nails and rubes with another operator under shelter assisting then the other side was brought under the hammer in like manner on three such sundays the only day available for him did this cheery fellow work in rain and wind i make no apology for acknowledging this sunday labour but for it the voyage had not been undertaken in time may i suggest that one's ends may not justify the means although motives may excuse them whilst judgments may not always spell justice a friend in passing remarked 
if that old boat sinks i hope that'll be on a sunday curiously enough he received the retort courteous when he one sunday soon after was obliged to start his holiday tour behind a motorboat on the seventh day we did not rename the boat the walrus and launch her until early in august and did not start on our voyage until the ninth chico drain and i in an idling hour exchanged reminiscences said he where are my medals oh i'm sorry but things was so bad i left em in newcastle but i pay the interest on em as it comes due that lot showing me his photograph dated 1907 don't represent all my medals and clasps i'd seft or saved ninety lives from drowndon when i'd got that lot and more came along when i'd totaled a hundred and seven lives adventures well i had a foo of course and not always pleasant ones my fust save was a bather on yarmouth beach i didn't get a thank for that then thirty-eight year ago i went to newcastle i'm sixty-nine now earning my livin by eel catchin and shrimpin as i'm now doin here my biggest haul in one day was nine water police and one recruit they'd been swamped i rode up and soon had some in my boat the rest hanging by their hands to the gunnels i got a new watch and chain by that little bit of good luck i once dived eighty-five feet with my clothes on from the high level bridge what i was a happening to be walking on some boy had fallen in off the fountain steps my wust experience well that was jumpin in arter a boy what fell off a raft we was fairly drawed under them twenty odd foot balks bein pretty nigh rasped to dead and we both come up pretty nigh done for i once brought three gals ashore what was on a plank what broke in the middle and let em in corpses i never swum for a live person and brought him ashore a corpse but many a one have i recovered in the ornery way floatin or by a drug or drag oh yes people will cling but i always dived and they always let go and come to the top givin me a chance to catch hold on em to a little better advantage a scotchman who was drowndin turned on me and hit out and scratched i had to make him drop it and the minute he was quiet i seft him one woman i brought out kept yellin let me die and as soon as i got her out in she jumped again so i rescued her a second time and held to her an independent wealthy gent walked overboard accidentally and somehow managed to grip hold of some weedy piles i went over arter him and got him safe ashore he was so grateful that he comes next day to mine and says i think i'm in your debt for savin of me well sir i says i'm open to a little reward and it was a reward a two shillin piece i felt like chuckin at him but i turned and showed him my back and walked away here is a man in humble life a real hero making no noise drawing no rewards in all weathers toiling night and day on the tides with eel pots and shrimp trawl 
for a bare living and an uncertain one at that brave as a lion he is as gentle-mannered as a woman his greatest grief that he cannot yet redeem the medals that record his bravery drain is an honest fellow and looks it with a voice as pleasing as his manners i think that my run across braden through that fierce west-south-west breeze was made the more enjoyable by knowing that so sturdy a swimmer and so brave a man was my pilot skipper and chum on that memorable sunday morning End of chapter 1chapter two of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain our ship leaves dock at length on saturday the last day of august eighteen thirty nine we too weighed anchor at concord a port of entry and departure for the bodies as well as the souls of men a warm rain had obscured the morning and threatened to delay our voyage with a vigorous shove we launched our boat from the bank while the flags and bulrushes courtesied a god speed and silently dropped down the stream quotation by thoreau our philosopher's boat in which he made his eventful voyage that had cost him a week's labour in the spring was fifteen feet in length by three feet and a half in breadth his propulsion depended upon two pairs of oars poles for shoving in shallows also two masts one of which served for a tent pole he had a buffalo skin for a bed and a cotton cloth for a roof adding a pair of wheels when necessary for getting around portages his lazarette contained certain food stores that seemed meat only for rabbits he relied somewhat upon his fishing rod and maybe his traps for he had already disposed of his gun moreover he says i have actually fished from the same kind of necessity that the first fishers did and whatever may have been his philosophy upon the shedding of blood he goes on once or twice i found myself ranging the woods like a half-starved hound with a strange abandonment seeking some kind of venison which i might devour he confesses too that he slew squirrels but abhorred their flesh i see myself not far removed from him in my preference for eels and tench or a young wild rabbit and what shall we say of a gentlewoman leaving her yacht in eager search for an innocent lamb's chops or a tin of corned bovine at the nearest broadland emporium thoreau died in eighteen sixty two aged forty five years a warning to the would-be recluse and ascetic a dreamy bachelor taking warning by his mortifications which this eccentric thinker appeared to glory in and my own inconveniences of punt voyaging i resolved on building a cabined boat and fitting her with a sail that would spare me the physical exertions that made of pleasure a labour i can recommend such a ship as my new venture proved to be inconspicuous as she was and is from the standpoint of beauty an impecunious young fellow once owner and all building debts paid might in such a craft do the broads year after year at a very small outlay upon its upkeep 
an annual coat of paint a half sovereign for river dues and say a sovereign for moorings in a private cutting might well be covered with a year's tobacco money weekends in summer and an annual holiday may be pleasantly spent thus upon rivers and broads hurry and scamper need not be indulged in and in wet or blowy weather a young fellow is as well off afloat in his small cabin as at home with a few favourite books and his spells of rest unless a prospective voyageur intends to use his ship more than one season it would be better i think and cheaper by far to pal in with a party of like spirits and hire a yacht which should be roomy and captained by a regular yachtsman the amateur who knows nothing of sailing should not fail to engage a friendly navigator to show him his hand a friend of mine profiting by my experiences in the yarwhelp speculated in a shilling's worth of splines and a cheap canvas awning which he fitted to his sailing boat and has since enjoyed delightful holidays on the broads my son-in-law who has his own small yacht joined hands with me and we twain put the cabin together added rudder and mast and spars and brought the walrus into being much of the building material had been found floating on braden from time to time ownerless and unreclaimed bits of deal a length of waterlogged pitch pine out of which we made the combings and odd slabs of launch oak which were sawed up for bearers these had been stored in the boat shed for any useful purpose that might make demand upon them some for years and we drew upon them as we progressed i kept all the sawyer's bills and the receipts for new stuff for cabin roof floorings linings and rafters of the copper nails and rungs the brass screws and galvanised wire nails the porthole lights and sundry until they looked so formidable that had i suspected the sum total of it i might have been tempted to retain the yarwhelp and its canopy but i was out for copy for new experiences and a vaster comfort not to mention a search for renewed health and vigour a great desideratum my beds and blankets on this voyage needed now no packing up by day my cookery utensils and crockery had their proper lockers and places a rally round the cabin sides held many handy things and even the combings or cabin sides were sprinkled with favourite photographs and other trinkets there was some entertainment and pleasure in drawing plans in designing curves and angles and in watching sawn and planed bits of wood fall into place and at length to have before us a completed machine he who once builds a boat often itches to build another we obtained a little mast and a handy sail from johnson the yachting man at st olives who was not slow either to tender useful advice then there was the painting and the varnishing and the making of the rudder surely the little bits of tinkering and touching up upon a vessel vie in interest with the amateur motorman's dirty glory a fiddling on his back beneath the bowels of his car the screwing and the titivating the grease rag flourishing and the smelly smells are not these exercises part of the game 
the would-be boat builder may like to know how we progressed in piecing the ship together first the floor bearers were laid and tacked in position then the floors put down next the four short posts upon each gunwale to carry the combings and the arched roof bearers the ends and settles were added and the roof then nailed on strengthening pieces a foot rest and a ring were added to the bulkhead near the bows to step the mast in cupboards were then erected at the cabin ends and the canvas stretched upon the cabin top and painted and painted yet again a coat being given the boards beneath the calico i shall be pleased to let any would-be builder examine my ship at any time before the hull had been roofed in i had of course blow lamped off the many skins of paint and tar upon the boat and then painted her strakes above the water line a leaden colour and where the tar refused to give up every stain i treated such spots to a licking of no tine which made her take her adorning without more demur then there came along the stores the ropes and rond anchor stakes and crutches for the mast and spars the awning to fling over the cockpit in the evening and leaving it there when the morning rains were troublesome on the low-built settles came the oat straw palliasses alias cushions the blankets and the pillows clad in amber reps a kit bag of extra clothing and a change of underwear a primus stove a tin of paraffin and another of spirits saucepans kettle frying pan plates cups and saucers jug spoons knives and prongs tin opener pricker towels wash bowl soap brushes of sorts tins of sugar tea milk cocoa coffee salt and pepper jars of ham and butter bottles of vinegar and pickles and tins of meat and fruit added to these was a bottle of ammonia lotion to counteract the attentions of mosquitoes or a possible attack of wasps another of friar's balsam and a bit of old clean linen pens ink and paper even buttons and thread and needles had their proper stations in the rally and fishing rod and tackle a barometer a little compass a thermometer and a spring balance brought up the rear some favourite books too had their niche on top of a cupboard this inventory of groceries and crocks may cause a smile but nevertheless such stores are absolutely necessary for every voyageur who would be happily berthed aboard his ship must carry domesticity with him with its comforts an unmended patch a lost brace button a wasp sting in a prominent position a scrubby chin are not desirable and add no dignity to a yachtsman nor to his comfort the worries of thirty years ago when bread and meat and vegetables needed searching for exist no longer for every village caters for holiday folk and peripatetic shop folk go about in motor cars and even boats as did the bum boaters in the days of nelson when his fleets were lying at anchor in yarmouth roads and so having shipped our supplies we on thursday august the ninth sailed out of means dyke at st olives at four p m several friends ashore wishing us bon voyage and read the inscription in chalk upon the bows the walrus our nameplates having not yet arrived 
our boom swept aside the reeds on our port side bending them low to spring erect again as we left them behind us the marsh farmer had cut down the huge reed bed leaving only that narrow fringe bordering it quite the usual thing to do beside rivers affected by tides as these fringes act as a fencing to keep high tides accompanied by strong winds from washing swathes and heaps of the reeds into the tideway to be a nuisance to boating and a loss to the owner the reeds have to lie several days during big tides in order to get a chance to dry to stack them wet would court disaster it was interesting to watch the martins and swallows flying low over the stubble standing in the water snapping up hundreds of minute beetles flies spiders and various other insects that had crawled to the topmost inches and hung there and deftly picking up others that feebly swam in the deeper places as the waters subsided starlings and wagtails joined in the quest which pied wagtails have been numerous this season thanks to the fewer cuckoos to usurp their nests the walrus as we had fondly hoped behaved remarkably well was stiffer than we suspected her her broad beam her low cabin and wide stern helped by half a hundredweight of ballast warranting a steadiness of character that was commendable on a lazy ebb tide with a scanty wind she seemed to exhibit a desire to look behind her and the dinghy showed an inclination to act a bit contrary both making efforts to run in double harness rather than in tandem a horsey yachtsman will well understand this simile this behaviour did not meet with the skipper's approbation especially when a craft with a higher peak and a vaster spread of sail moved by in a more sailor-like fashion hence the oars were outthrust and indifferent comportment rebuked the idleness and lassitude not to say contrariness of the winds was a distinguishing feature if not of august generally at least of the usual samples vouchsafed to the skipper and crew of the walrus during the greater part of our voyage on a frisky gale our ship resented constraint and would negotiate an ebb or a flood tide with saucy eagerness making her cutwater throw aside the waters in foamy swathes to bubble in a twistering wake behind her when she would turn almost in her own length and get back again to her work with another sharp turn of the tiller she was built for the sea and sluggish inland waters she certainly resented we never made the tiller fast and only once did she so far forget herself as to ship water over the gunwale without incident we reached Braden on an even keel we had been watching her rather than the birds bringing in a verdict of not guilty my lord as we ran the walrus's nose into the mud befronting my Braden boat shed there to ride at anchor until the morrow's early flood i spent my first night aboard her here and munched my supper to the music of the gulls as i sat in the cockpit peering under the awning in the gloaming i thought of many old habitues of the gaunt old boat sheds and of the yachting folk of a long past generation who once crowded the dozen stagings now but a huddle of rotting posts upon which grow waving seaweeds 
thereat used to lie max old gem david garrard's mayflower suffling's falcon the vivid the oasis the maud the ada and the ethel then a proud array of locally owned vessels that made the town end of Braden gay with sails and bunting when fred baldry lucky bob edmonds and others were noted helmsmen i recall to mind the puntsman harry bond palmer jimmy Hur, admiral gooch strike sharman and many another unknown to-day save in the drifting traditions of their own descendants the braden bridge killed yachting the growing flats and closer drainage of the marshland levels exterminated fowl and fowlers the altered conditions of braden and the lower reaches of the rivers also wiped out smelter and eelman mulleter and fisherman as time and change twin destroyers removed an old old man whom i knew who took his silent way to the waterside with trembling limbs and aged thoughts but poor old piscator disappeared all but unnoticed in his dropping out and nobody else remembers him now and enoch walked with god and nature and he was not for god took him how can a fellow like myself whose pleasures of my early youth have become the inheritance of other men forget those vanished and romantic days the very haunts of these men have passed away and who will a decade or so hence remember borough water frolic or the burney arms one barrel pub the old lord nelson and the staff of life whereat these men made merry and spun yarns that were spiced with folk and nature lore with stirring reminiscences and pungent linguistics ragged old Karen in his mildewed scallop has ferried them every one across the sticks at eleven next morning on the early flood the walrus with the dinghy and the old punt yarwhelp towing behind her was drifted under the bridges past the shrimp boats the punts and yachts that lay moored beside the muds and gnarly timbered quays End of chapter 2chapter three of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain and now for ranworth the call of the wild sends men to the mountains to the forests and streams to all the innumerable places where one must fight to live we ought if possible to pass one month of each year at the auberge de la belle etoile sleeping on mother earth cooking food we have caught or killed braving heat and cold rain and sun absorbing at every pool the virtue of the wilderness by h a Vachel, from the daily mail surely i am not alone in my astonishment at the ease with which those who drift and sail around broadland forget the days and dates as well as the swift flight of the passing time one day has already been counted in in crossing braden an eight mile run and another have we spent in reaching stokesby a like distance putting in the night there we had hoisted sail on the flood tide after certain delays and had only reached runham 
for the noontide meal we had been much entertained by the ways of passing amateur yachts folk who have dressed themselves so gaily for the part who know so little of boating that they resent a friendly hint apparently preferring to learn wit by untoward experience there were three young fellows whom we later met in a yearside cutting who were in distress soon after starting from thorpe unlucky seamanship had unnerved them beyond repair so they snugged down using their vessel as a lodging house and made short holiday excursions by train wise young men perhaps as we started this morning we noticed another amateur struggling fiercely with an only oar against a concrete breakwater where on his sail bellied with the east wind pushed his ship again and again he took our tip lowered his sail and accepted a towing off a little ahead five dandies elaborately got up had got aground in the wind's eye and were properly stuck our tip was resented keenly so i delayed a moment and sketched this pentagonal concourse of brilliant seamen as they sweated thanking them for their sitting a hundred yards farther on they were acrobatting again so we went by in silence they must have felt no young fellow doing the broads should step aboard a yacht without having first read up a little from the guide-books and also on the rudiments of sailing etiquette and science meantime we were steadily progressing the skipper at the tiller the scribbler at his book my thoughts and memory wandered over those grassy levels through which the river sinuously meandered where so many daybreaks and sunsets found me in days of yore gun in hand a loafing those marshes in spring echoed the petulant cries of the nesting redshanks on frosty days they abounded with lapwings and often golden plover on autumn evenings ducks came from the sea to the shell-sprinkled ditches when flooded by excessive rains in the shorter days or through a bank break which formed vast spreading lagoons they often swarmed with mallard and with potchard where yon unsavoury horse shambles are situated was then a shooter's corner where walking gunners foregathered in sniping days and blizzards for many years stood there the black boards where they sheltered and gossiped during the storms billy samson a noted lame fowler passed midnights here and slew fowl by ear as they passed overhead and his cunning retriever silently collected fowl that fell to other guns as well how could they identify their own victims even if suspicion was aroused on those morby marshes hares abounded and poachers nightly wandered among them trotter lodge was the doyen he was also quarrelsome and loved a rough and tumble with the men of velveteen and gentlemen in blue yarmouth jail was familiar to him cadger brown ostensibly collected watercress and mushrooms under these floral tributes frequently lay poached hares inside the basket and occasionally tame conies scarborough jack one of my heroes was clever at the game too 
but cautious and conciliatory and prettily could he spin a yarn to an appreciative listener george blake a noble man to look at was an ardent student of lepusian zoology and what he did not know of hares of the ways and doings of wild rabbits as well as mallard and widgeon they scarce knew themselves in workless days and idle hours these shrewd wild fellows made good apology for a livelihood and many unsuspecting townsfolk and those who were not bold enough to poach themselves through these committed it by proxy on those lowlands hair coursing in the seventies was a popular sport which allured all the sporting coves from yarmouth with their greyhounds and their lurchers vehicles brought the swell mob the vulgar horde coming afoot but poor puss has since become vermin and fallen on yet more evil days and so still thinking and sighing over the good old days we reached runham stave whereat we stayed to dine my skipper dropping the tiller for the fry-pan handle with both of which he maketh a pleasant tune the breeze meantime fell away and the surface of the lifting river became as glass in which the drowsy reeds reversed themselves and the struggling insects upon the surface courted our attention but they were too many to rescue so we pitied the short-lived things and left them to the birds and fishes that they in turn might live how rife and reckless is nature with life when millions are formed only to be devoured and annihilated by others cope pods gobbled up by crustaceans crustaceans devoured by fishes and these in turn by seals and porpoises which the polar bears prey upon bears killed by man and man slaughtering his fellow and death conquering all that lives the stokesby kiddies espying us lifted their heads from waterside playing and began their monotonous dull chanting old barleycorn the village schoolmaster found us out and kindly pressed a bag of stokesby onions on us which he had collected for us and which we had shortly to relegate to the dinghy's aloof keeping i asked him to give me the words of that confused jingle his rendering was thusly old john barleycorn he's the prettiest man of all he can hop and he can skip he can play the fiddlestick a sublime insane sample of riverside rhyming i noticed that the urchins instead of quarrelling sensibly among themselves played listlessly and bagpiped this atrocity in verse without fervour although a little more lustily as a likely yacht loomed up an old native lady assured us that they had sung it to her knowledge fifty year and more and that the wherry babes droned it in their cradles and as if in substantiation of her assertions a mother wheeled a perambulator past that held a couple of mites the smaller one actually in baby language struggling with the refrain at stokesby there are awkward bends in the river shaped like a double-ended meat hook and what you gain on one rounding you lose by being wind pushed into the next where the reeds jut out aggressively into the river at the speed we started for acle we dared not prophesy our arrival 
i wondered if they were to mow these bristling reeds as they have done the hedgerows not that hedge trimming has lessened road dangers but rather increased them would it be easier and safer to negotiate the corners then the drifting marsh hay further hampered us even impeding the rudder by fouling the pintles and the gudgeons birds were remarkable for their absence a gull passing high overhead a heron a little lower crossing the marshes and now and then an unseen moorhen croaking in the sedges and that was all once in a while we felt a cat's paw of wind when the faint v-shaped wake behind us made a crystal bubble or two a little beyond john barleycorn's village we ran into a flock of swallows that were vigorously plunging upon the surface of the river so strong their impact that the splashes hid them for an instant the spray rising as at the plungers of turns their booty was a miserable drift of insects that had been blown or borne into the water by atmospheric conditions or maybe had been washed off the reeds by a passing motor-boat i leant over the gunwale dipping my hand under some of them and bottled them in spirits a few of which i sent to mr tholus an entomologist of repute who sorted them over they comprised he assured me a yellow-bodied sawfly and several staphylina oxytellus weevils citones several ichneumons and various flies a number of red elytrade staphylinids staphylina erythropterus struggling as we passed them eluded my grip but the swallows deftly nabbed them and i wished heartily they would come and save me from the thunderflies that lit upon my face then the wind had pity on us and bustled us giving us an excellent slant of it that soon landed us at Acol. oak lay of the ancients ac lay of the rurals and akel of the stranger folk a not unpleasant village with a pretty church a busy street and a dangerous motoring corner not unlike a bent bottleneck which the baker on the spot assured me was the safest spot in norfolk i asked him why he emphatically answered that the maddest of motormen who knew it as a danger spot most carefully negotiated it something in that i observed no unemployed loafing in quiet acle and a native young lady insisted that it was god's own village may it remain in his keeping from the river acle has a peculiarly trim and dutch-like outlook all but around the yacht folk's mooring place with its grimy wicked footpath it is said that an old lady observing a gentleman on a certain road studying a guide-book asked him what be yow a lookin for sir i am an american said he and i'm seeking a certain roman road why boar she answered your honour this he snorted stranger i guess not well sir she insisted it were made in them roaming days but it ain't been mended since it must have been acle stave i made a few notes as follow patient anglers plumbing the river's depths a ledgering not much doing sauntered to the village shopping 
skipper hobnobbing with other skippers as skippers do at noon daughter nelly arrived with various goodly home-cooked viands and we had a tablecloth on to give a touch of homeliness to the repast i bolted home in the evening for my binoculars that had been left behind returned in the morning and had a gossip with various weekenders who sojourn here weekly for quietude loafed around eastick's boat station memorandum i have noticed that in almost every boat station one aged boat at least lies somewhere around spared from sentiment perhaps or old-time memories here in a grassy corner lay a long narrow hull a rotting that had once on a time been engined the timbers were distorted strakes decaying and wisps of sturdy reeds were growing between its ribs the aged hulk is picturesque if not attractive in its perishing later at southgates i saw an early designed old yacht tumbling at its leisure to pieces in a dilapidated boat shed it is the same elsewhere notably at tolton where in particular an ancient hulk of a houseboat leans helplessly against a wall at the rear of the commodore whose complexity of designs cover several periods of architecture probably egyptian ionian early english and futurist it still grows uglier in its retirement and decay yet as a rule these huddles of pensioned craft are traps with which to catch an artist's eye and now for ranworth the skipper cast adrift and the crew tied in leash the dinghy and the yarwhelp to throw the latter off for good and all when we shall have staked in ramworth dyke we enjoyed a bit of free sailing soon after we had cleared fishley mill and the yarwhelp put on a show of restiveness bumping her sharp iron-clad prow into the stern of the walrus her successor so much so that i had to cover her nose with an old velour hat and lash it on the outlook was fairly lively with moving craft some crowded with feminine beauty clad in rainbow tints who lolled idly and coquetted gaily with their friends of the opposite gender old folk envy them their youth and gallantry and chip up blithely when they recall an almost forgotten fact that they too were once as youthful and as merry and gay my sober skipper had little eye for these and so solely devoted his attention to the walrus's paces and as carefully negotiated these passing argosies as any old smackmaster who races through the roadstead at sea on a following wind with tact and adroitness amongst a fleet of tacking schooners and coasters and like these old coasters left behind so too our moving argosies passed beyond and were lost in the distance many of these august voyageurs were hastening to the coming regattas on the waveney i was tickled by the folks whom we had passed at the various expressions upon their faces some looked astonished at the walrus and nodded comment to each other some laughed and giggled not at us but over private fancies others were on their dignity and yet others were ultra dignified almost painfully so i observed one or two who knew a little about yachts and motors and many that knew more 
the former took greater pains to impress onlookers but every one apparently aimed at looking impressive the old male hand in his stylish navy blue coat and regulation white cap the lady of the barge when elderly too looking egregiously emphatic and imposing there were fussy folk in keeping with their snorting motors there were placid sweet people crowded in squat motor-boats with impish hornless little gramophones rattling out gay tunes like destiny and home sweet home these boxes of potted music are fast ousting the once popular though usually weary pianos that used to be guilty of shaking out rather flat waltzes as one sailed by or the fractious wind drifted the lazy tunes usward in its playful moods i do not know what to say of these sunday usages but yacht folks afloat are at least out of the way of those who hold austerely strong opinions upon sunday pleasuring let every man who has one consult his own conscience and he who would condemn another take heed of his own shortcomings we staked down at four o'clock at the entrance to ranworth broad and having in due course washed our platters and our hands we sat a while in the cockpit enjoying the restfulness of this little corner of eden an old gentleman a native in his sunday broadcloth with his comfortable spouse and another lady came slowly towards the river he sculling leisurely they sitting demurely on the afterthwart their feet ensconced in the sweet marsh hay that littered the flat slow-paced hay boat he had rowed to church and was rowing home again we exchanged greetings when the old fellow patronizingly remarked well boar ya coat tell me where yow ha been to but it did not i thought for my comfortable light khaki coat had not known me as an old soldier of the sort he meant my skipper having squared up rode off to the maltster's arms in the dinghy towing the old yarwhelp to her new owner's domains in the peacefulness of the evening we up stakes again and cast off to quietly drift downstream to lie almost under the shadow of st bennet's abbey in a sequestered corner where the tall reeds folded us in their bosom and so we settled for the night and so to roost end of chapter three chapter four of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain in pump mill country between womack dyke and potter Hayam are two or three fine old windmills good specimens of the picturesque structures whose work it is to be feared will at no very distant date be done by ugly brick or corrugated iron house steam pumps the interior is often an eerie place even on calm nights strange noises are heard faint sighings creakings and groanings by william a dutt from his book norfolk broads on monday august the thirteenth we were astir at six a m when having drawn in our eel lines without a bait missing we had an early snap and were under way at seven to begin a leisurely drift downstream to thurn mouth 
passing but one or two idling yachts from whence came a semi-nude figure for his morning dip or the aroma of appetizing viands or the laughter of gay souls that were taking no thought for the morrow where else but in broadland silences can rest-seeking mortals arrive at such a condition of mind as to loathe the morning newspaper and crave no more nor dread the postman's knock nor the din of crowded streets in broadland man wants little here below but wants that little long we pulled up in sight of st bennet's abbey the old place hath a charm for me a fascination which i cannot explain built by wise artificers probably monks themselves on a peculiarly suitable and stable basis in the midst of marshy and boggy land and enough still left of its ruins for one's imagination to run riot over i can sit hard by it in all weathers under all conditions of light and shade and in the darkness and paint endless mental pictures of a remote and romantic past and hold converse with the spirits of just men i hope made perfect if i may quote from hebrews twelve i wonder if the utilitarian who stuck that presumably flour mill tower in the midst of the ruins possessed a poetic soul or was he a gross unpardonable cynic my prosy skipper thought he was a smart fellow but could not explain why it seemed to me to be even a greater sacrilege than that that a dozen huge black swine should be grubbing around rooting with their ill-favoured snouts in soil wherein lie buried bones of devout men there flew overhead or scuttled by the usual commonplace fowls a heron or two dotting the sky above head a score or more starlings or on some important business possibly beetle catching on some freshly shorn reed bed a moorhen skulking with rancorous cry through a reedy corner these had engagements of their own without turning a questioning eye upon the drifting ship when near thurn mouth we grazed the bank and the drowsy atmosphere tempted us to throw out the rond anchor the cook also had suggested a breakfast of bacon and eggs those great standbys of all campers afloat or ashore which shortly gave forth an aroma that was irresistible i had been pottering around among the luxuriant prickly thistles on the cracked dry river dredgings upon the marsh edge where fluttered tortoise shells in erratic dancings over the purple thistle heads and a whole menagerie of insects grotesque ichneumon flies hovering sophiidae mimic wasps to look at and white rumped wild bees that sucked savagely at sweets that tickled their senses or chased away honey bees that would have shared them dead swan mussels dotted the barer soil with bluey shells and the brittle shell of the viviparous water snail was abundant but one heap of river dredgings is much like another and in due time the marsh flowers cover them with beauty to match the surroundings here as elsewhere the tormenting thunderflies were a nuisance an odd one or a couple sat squat upon the cabin top meditating annoyance and buzzed around one's head whenever it suited them in spite of protests 
wasps in squads are not so irritating even saints rebel against them and luther slaughtered flies without mercy calling them the emissaries of diabolus and the ghosts of heretics because they would inspect the pages of the book he read the monks swore they were immoral and the pious muscle man will shorten his prayers to swap them with his slipper in the name of the prophet one persevering fly comes back to mind he boarded us at stokesby a sort of stowaway and squatted just out of reach on the cabin top twice having a waltz around my head and finally left us at Acol. perspiring skippers at helm curse them deeply we turned into thurn river in a lively atmosphere but the wind was contrary we made a continuous tack of it but when it strengthened the walrus woke up and even suggested to us that she did not intend that a large yacht behind should pass us for two miles that little rag of ours outdistanced the larger spread of snowy canvas astern but bit by bit the topsail and huge jibsail grew bigger and at length went by but on her next short board she missed stays and rammed her nose in the bank her skipper said nothing that our sparrow should still outdistance his white-winged waterfowl my own skipper let her have it we ran into an inviting gap against a marshman's stave and landed in search of provender and milk both of which were just then in plenty in the marsh farm cottage i was shown a seat and the lady i presently found had often seen me in yarmouth you have here someone who knows salt water i remarked on noticing a little glass case of corals and some grotesque shells whilst upon the wall hung a coloured drawing of a wind jammer not to mention other treasures that conjured up visions of dark-skinned men and maidens nodding palms and dazzling white sea beaches and the music of the surf my reverie was rudely broken by another box of potted music on the river but it quickly passed out of hearing and a yet harsher sound though more appropriate came from the old mill's interior whose travailing machinery bemoaned the need of lubricants as parakeets clamour when hungry the visitor to the broadlands need scarce telling that the windmills dotting the low landscape for many a mile around do not grind corn but are harnessed instead to pumps or wheels that lift the surplus water from the marsh ditches over the banks or through the sluices into the rivers whose tides are often higher than the marsh levels there is a singularly dutch-like appearance in this country although the mill towers here are more symmetrical then if not so grotesque as their prototypes in holland today the steam engine helps in excessive rain floods although normally the cheaper wind power is still able to cope with the necessary drainage since my friend dutt wrote in 1903 new towers even have reared their caps and sails i love these old water mills and have enjoyed many golden sunsets and spent many moonless and moonlit nights beside them moored in the sedge or reed-lined mill-deek watching the tenant swallows taking their eventide flights around them the youngsters drilling with their seniors and sharing their gnats and midges 
whilst the starlings mounted the sail slats to chat and take a last look round the country before settling in some reed clump for the night hundreds of baby swallows are born in their feather-lined mud beds stuck on spikes and in decayed brick corners in the mill towers but all do not emerge into the sunshine and the joy of life for fluttering chicks in their practice flights sometimes alight on greasy cogwheel and become hopelessly besmeared to fall and die among the dust some small mites have a joy ride around the nest affixed to the central revolving shaft when the vane sees that the mill sails must needs go to windward to meet it the small bird's auger like a chalk ring encircles the floor by the shaft hole to chronicle the demise of a million insect pests next spring a thousand swallows from overseas spy a hundred much alike mill towers and without hesitation break their flock and haste to their last year's lodgings we had a good stare at potter the pleasant as we threaded our way among passing craft with the ease of a blue-black gyrinus natator beetle that zigzags its way through the mazy water dance of its kindred beetles on the still waters of a marsh ditch we hailed or were hailed by old acquaintances new ones ogled us inquiringly on the starboard side we passed moored yachts manned by gay crews every member of which looked as if town life and its worries had let go the leash that had held them in bondage and glad that the rumble of railroad wheels upon the train bridge had not been increased by their weights above them still more restful because more apparently permanent the gay bungalows on our port side that arose from amidst beds of still gayer flowers owned dulcy far nianting tenants if i may so mutilate my latinics who lolled and smiled contentment the two sides of the river bespeak the nomadic and the residential characteristics if you cannot reside in potter gay then sojourn there if your finances fail you court an invitation having a flat marshland behind it all the feeling of rocksome stiffness and oppressiveness its shut inness among overbearing trees is entirely absent at potter give me potter for hot overpowering summer days and roxham when chilly sea winds push landwards the sea fogs bred of broiling days hold the tiller see to the boom there we're going to shoot the bridge commanded captain kettle and i had to leave my cogitatings and smartly jump to it we had kept enough way on us so that as we approached the bridge the mast was snatched out of its cleats and lowered and the walrus pushed her iron-clad nose under the arch when with a little help by hand and later with the oars astern she took us neatly to the grassy bank and patiently submitted to restraint as i roped her to a stake there came to mind a long past day when kirby the angler put the idler the old small houseboat in a first cutting near the bridge the pioneer of a new era in waterside delights since then the little sentry box so to speak has been replaced by a mile and more of barracks we wanted to get to kendall dyke for the night so started betimes to do a run that under favourable circumstances should have taken an hour but the wind 
as usual showed obstinate and when it might have done us a goodly turn it eased i thought of another prophet who went down to joppa and booked a passage for tarshish the skipper reluctantly went ashore on the rond and tugged at a tow-rope shortly to commence grumbling about a shoe full of water that he had shipped and then another so on the old score of comparisons between a lamb and a sheep strained again at the tow-rope in due time we reached the dyke entrance with our reluctant vessel when my captain stepped aboard and took command to earn the philosopher's good opinion who wrote he is the best sailor who can steer within the fewest points of the wind and extract power out of the greatest obstacles the walrus crawled but kept on an aristocratic boatman with his sail hung topsy-turvy with leeches always wrong crept behind anxiously inquiring if his boat smaller than ours could negotiate the hickling weeds i told him i didn't know but try it and that ours had got to do it however much she might demur the gent turned tail a good gust of wind would have made him turn turtle at eight thirty we dropped sail beside robert vincent's eel hut finding the old sport looking a weary he was then wanting a nap as last night's vigil had robbed him of sleep through some luckless white running amok with a yacht among his nets and boys we shook and i and my man turned out of the grey night into warm blankets on the oat straw cushions on the low settles and were soon in the land of nod to jump up refreshed at five thirty on the morrow to see vincent haul his eel set pods and give the bewildered eels therein a second shock as they walloped out of the pods into the narrow-mouthed tub to solve the riddle of perpetual motion with squashy sounds of slapping tails and gurgling gullets those stones of eels had a lively ringmaster in one that scaled five pounds whose every squirm set them mazily gyrating round the barrel among the crowd had come up a splendid tench and a robust perch which twain were emptied into a half submerged trunk to join others captured during the week it is a matter for astonishment that so few scaly sided fishes enter the eel sets robert and i talked eel shop as usual and then he asked how many i could do with i said three pounds so one by one he finger locked an eel and threw it smartly on a board paralyzing it and i helped him of these a saucepanful were skinned and accompanied with onions and potatoes were soon bubbling around as a stew bob did not seem to observe hordes of eel fry little larger than in their larval state moving upstream in spring as i had seen them in the shallow edged ribble these tiny transparent thread needle sized things pass unnoticed in our dark waters and shady deep margins when in lancashire i watched mill operatives with sticks and muslin nets scoop out their thousands filling buckets that they took for them and sold them for snick pudding making nor did vincent argue the point that over year eels in thousands came upstream in april i had caught many in my punt at the harbour mouth on dark nights in my youth where my old friend 
t southwell stoutly denied my theory my broadland friend did not commit himself we had two or three fries and stews in all and dropped the last few overboard but not from want of appetite the morning sunrise had been charming and the following breeze that came after breakfast was a godsend at eight thirty we were spinning along the walrus behaving right handsomely to be checked when wayward or bringing the top strake a little too horizontally we called on miss e l turner for a chat on our favourite marshland birds upon which with pen and camera she is so great an authority and knows so many of their secrets and their household ways if you have heard two old field naturalists are gossiping know ye that an outside observer gets in but few words even edgeways and now you baggage to the walrus show your paces and she did we caracoled around the big hay boats on which stood movable statuesque marshmen weed drawing with long shafted dydles hickling weeds were being attacked at last this crop of cat's tail and water moss gave forth a smell inexpressible as it came to the surface to be sold by the ton for manure the vegetation of broadland is extremely rank growing both above and below water every year's fall of reed and sedge adds layer to layer a continued lack of suppression in some has made them swamps and eventually by a system of drainage into rich marsh and fertile cornlands we put the walrus's nose into some yet unshorn water gardens and her shallow draught allowed her to rollick through them to the great envy of three muscle-weary young yachtsmen on the water rat whose quants met no resistance and consequently did no service nor was our wind theirs they looked as sadly as the crew of vanderdecken on the flying dutchman that never more returned to port it seemed a pity that so fine a stretch of water should be so unnavigable i asked a local owner why this abomination he suggestively replied that they preferred to be quiet which covered and qualified the selfishness of riparian owners generally let her have it skipper and the good ship had it she wallowed she rollicked she churned up behind her a wake of eddying bubbles she doubled this way and that like a hound with a hare before it she had already let in water through the upper dry strakes but a bucket or so more did not matter never since her sea-going days until the day she wallowed over Braden, and to-day at hickling had she enjoyed so lively and roistering a spin we gave our ship a rest at the pleasure boat stave at hickling and went ashore to go a shopping when lo a travelling shop on a motor van stopped to let us see the groceries inside so we bought bread and various good things including butter which was a rather doubtful bit of grease even solomon's historic pot of ointment had a fly in it ours had a mixed look about it like the flavour that followed it to our bread perhaps our palates had been coddled but even the skippers proved rebellious maybe the eels like pharaoh's vulgar flesh-pots 
had corrupted the grumbling gypsying sons of israel i wandered to vincent's cottage meeting there mrs grosvenor the medal-holding champion lady shot we were old friends and the shooting range being vacant i went where many crack shots had often before assembled to be beaten she challenged me and so after twenty-seven years a total abstainer from powder and shot i pointed at pigeons made of clay my first pull was a fluke for a safety catch gun i had never handled before and the pigeon was well on the way for potter Hayam before i pulled and missed mrs grosvenor winged it so she did number two which i fairly missed number three i shot to fragments and might have got my hand in again but like a courteous competitor i asked not to be tempted to spoil her reputation as an expert shooter at two ten p m we got under way again and bowled away for martham End of chapter four chapter five of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain the hickling bitterns the coot was swimming in the reedy pool beside the water hen so soon affrighted and in the weedy moat the heron fond of solitude alighted the moping heron motionless and stiff that on a stone as silently and stilly stood an apparent sentinel as if to guard the water lily by tom hood the month of august is the yachtsman's holiday season when white wings gliding gracefully between long miles of rush margined marsh banks intensify the vivid greenery of broadland summer time in the distance where the serpentine rivers wind unseen below the level of the reeds and rushes moving craft appear as if gliding through or across the marshlands in blithe may the sere and brittle reeds left from last year's crop rise leafless in vast drab masses and these with the spikes and spears of a newer growth harbour chattering sedge and reed warblers and divers other sylvidae bearded tits clamber up the reed mace chipping at the overripe pokers that are puffed by withering time and scattering the seeds like cotton wool to the playful breezes white pated coots obsessed by the pairing instinct and the jealousy of rivals flutter across still waters that break into lines of dancing foam as their dusky semi palmated toes trail and paddle upon the surface more hens croak harshly in impenetrable reed beds slim brown rails answer them back and great crested grebes dive spiritedly among the shoals of small fishes scaring them into precipitate bolting to hide beneath the water weeds soon to bob up again with mandibles gaping widely with struggling fissures held securely between them where you least expected them to reappear in lone corners and in secluded bites standing thigh deep in the shadows or on tussocky margins sober grey herons wait for prey their bodies in huddled ease 
or with tense eagerness and yellow eyes ablaze with hungry desire a giddy young rud unheeding rising to a floating insect or a sedge bird's feather a water vole unsuspecting swimming by when the heron's dagger bill with a lightning thrust lays hold of it the bird now all animation gulps down fish or vole dips his bill in the water then shakes it sagely and looking around as if reassuring himself that he has not been overlooked utters a harsh scream picks up his green legs behind him as he lifts himself on his big rounded wings to alight again beside some weedy ditch he wots of where water shrews frolic and frogs are sagely studying insect life one scarcely needs catalogue the broadland birds that swim or haunt these placid lagoons the naturalist who would hobnob with them with no malice aforethought is wise to visit them in may for the wild life of these silences is then still free of disturbing craft and trippers and the turmoil of the water pageantry in merry may the birds wax bold and confident laying their fears and pusillanimity aside until their evil days shall come marshland flowers may not all yet have awakened but the lover of birds will overlook this in the joys of the bird song and the delights revealed by his binoculars dr emerson Dutt, Ernest Suffling, and Christopher Davies have written largely on the charms of Broadland springtime. Richard Lubbock and Stevenson, and the Reverend M. C. H. Bird, have fascinatingly described the finny, furry, and feathery denizens of these alluring waterways. In May 1920, i had the good fortune to be guest and supercargo of a quartet of eminent british ornithologists who had determined to hear and see the norfolk bitterns we set sail from wroxham the first let of the season on the twelfth in the well-found comfortable pleasure wherry reindeer its huge white sail bellying to a favourable breeze drove the cutwater through curling waters as a ploughshare turns moist earth a quick run past salus and horning brought us to thurn mouth where we rounded up for gay potter now empty and silent with her shutters up as one winds along upon these rivers the vaster portion of the waters lay hidden only here and there blotches and streaks of pearliness held in the greenery are seen as broads and river reaches glide into view our skipper was an original as well as an aboriginal and also knew his work his outlook on life had been broadened on the canals of belgium and he had seen strenuous service in the king's navy under admiral craddock he and our cook had been messmates in one of the only two ships that had not gone down in the pacific sea fight brown's wrinkled face and humorous eyes would screw into a merry focus when some choice reminiscence cropped up in his mind once said he when i was in the service one of our chaps went ashore at dover to buy suffin but he went and speculated in beer instead and was coming aboard full up when a hand was dropped athwart his shoulder and he was marched off into clink next morning he went afore the captain 
what have you to say about it ax the captain who warn't half a bad un nothing my hearty says the chap with a wink but why don't you don't say anything about it yourself sir the skipper leastwise the captain concluded brown shets his eye and thinks a minute all right says he dismiss and the chap dismisses on this trip the weeds in hickling broad made it next to impossible to sail across it so we staked down in kendall dyke to make minor excursions in the sailing dinghy into the haunts of the wild fowl that we had come to see even then our sailing was so much hampered that we had occasionally to lift the centreboard as it fouled the water moss which rose nearly to the surface and to clear the rudder also when we hit clear water we romped along during the war some tons of this plaguey weed had been drawn out and sent to the paper mills some sort of brown paper was made of it but at best it was only fit for wrapping soap in indeed said my friend who had been engaged in the experiment it was hardly good enough for that the ditches veining the marshes were bright with frog bit and water violets the marshes themselves alive with snipes whose chirruping and drumming were heard by night and day on the easterly wind came the boom of the bitterns out of the reedy masses on the friday morning the twelfth in particular the clamour of the bitterns was incessant their booming early awakened me their cries were like the sounding of horns i joined linkhorn a keeper and we discussed this strange cry which had become quite commonplace to him he thought five booms were the usual number uttered in succession although he had heard six a gentleman said he once braised me out that it never made six so they decided to locate a bird and count his output the very first bona fide count ran up to six was the doubter convinced i asked well laughed linkhorn he says that's worth half a pound a backer and as i got the backer it certainly fared as if he was my friends and i heard the bitten boom seven times in one corner of the broad and twice much nearer did we distinctly count eight now how was this booming managed a gunner assured the reverend m c h bird that bitterns grasp a bunch of reed with their feet and balance themselves upon it keeping the tip of their up-pointed beak on a level with the top of the reeds the reed grasping may have been merely automatically performed for the bird will boom on level ground and in confinement the bill certainly is upraised to give full vent to its music just as a black-backed gull stretches his neck and elevates his head to yell reverting back to the number of booms mr t a coward counted nine but admits that the first singer might have been overlapped by a rival i had an excellent opportunity of listening to one individual and seven blasts of his trumpet seemed his average i did not catch but one backdraught before the uttering of the first but distinctly did i recognise the seemingly laborious indrawn oom 
between the louder booms differing in the quality of the music i likened these variations to those of alternations of the up and down noises produced by a wheezy old pump's handle the keepers punted us to a wild squashy level bristling with reed stumps that stood in moisture with a phalanx of uncut dead reeds all around that recalled milton's description a boggy surtis neither sea nor good dry land higher tides from the river soaked these swamps and low ebbs drew the waters back into the channels the punts swam deeply in the drains with the weight of us and as my friends were proof against getting wet feet i remained in charge while they went in indian file to see the small bundle of dead flags and rushes that had been the bittern's nursery two dead squabs lay within it the others had skulked into hiding under one limp body was discovered a burying beetle necrophorus an insect whose mission in life is to scent out little dead bodies scratch the earth from under them and act in fact as sexton but what hope on a wet swamp had the misguided thing for a safe development of egg and larvae our two broadmen were statuesque fellows as they stood erect in each punt's stern quanting with slender toad poles steadily silently like gondoliers and with easy grace of movement as we left the deserted nest the keepers discussed their bitterns like as in human families young bitterns differ in size due to a succession of births the hen bird sat as soon as her first egg was laid which accounts for these differences referred to the bittern babies are a rapacious generation and are fed from dawn to dusk upon small fishes eels water beetles little water voles and frogs among other interesting incidents of this trip was a stroll across a drier level where red shanks were nesting and when we were hidden among a clump of small beech and alders we had a pleasurable half hour watching a pair of montague's harriers that sailed around in airy circles as we quantered back to the wherry we passed a mother shoveler with her mottled black and yellow and down-clad family which bobbed and scuttled around the broken bank whilst the old bird lay flat down to make herself less conspicuous at the same time squealing lustily her instructions her odd cries of bridget bridget only ending when the ducklings were well out upon the broad and she herself had joined them much of the blame for the extermination of some of our characteristic broadland birds has been laid to the charge of those who so closely drained our lowlands and swampy places it would be fairer to lay most of it to the rapacity of bird skin and egg collectors who decimated the ranks of the old birds and diminished the numbers of their prospective young by remorseless egging if you want proofs read lubbock's fauna of norfolk or the paget sketch of the natural history of yarmouth open it at page ten of the introduction do not rely alone upon my word for it had not ruthless slaughter of such now rare birds as spoonbills cranes avocets ruffs and black terns obtained they would have bred with us to-day since the remnant of the bitterns was protected 
these interesting birds have increased and become established again and stevenson's remark that i believe this species has altogether deserted us during the breeding season does not hold good today at five p m one may evening in nineteen nineteen i took train to acle with mr percy h palmer and having had tea with the family proceeded to an obscure corner of the broad district by motor-car mrs palmer accompanying us at sutton we picked up one thane a marshman who with several helpers had just rescued by rope and pulleys from a boggy hole a valuable horse we were soon upon the water thane rowing us upstream turning shortly a watery bending and then threading a narrow passageway between a maze of young sedges and dead reeds that margined the dark brown trickle whereon lay wind-ruffled lily pads with here and there a breaking bud upon the surface making the current forced a while to stray murmur and bubble as it shoots away the grey skies and the dying out wind did not encourage a floral display only stray wisps of ragged robin seemed to dare them not a midge or a mosquito had ventured out two pairs of red shanks chortled indignantly at our intrusion five wife deserting mallards flew around us with suspicion the coots and grebes appeared too busy in the thicker reed beds to paddle out and upbraid us where was the bittern's nest my companions waded through the sopped swamp in rubber boots but i all unprepared did not hesitate to splash ankle-deep with them for the sake of what promised my boots filling up and running over with water at the first onset the tide said thane had been hained by the norally breeze sending the water up thus flooding the low level of vegetation by some inches otherwise the merest sloppiness would have distinguished our trackway a bit of fluffy string fluttering at the top of a dry reed stem marked the location of the nest which practically floated among the sedges it was a low squat damp enough bundle of dead reed leaves and splinters that contained five hearty corduroy coloured chicks each clad in downy pyjamas very like llama pelt in texture warm undoubtedly and no bad fit as capital a bit of protective coloration as i ever saw when taking into consideration dull drabs of the reeds and other dead vegetation which bed and bed curtains were made of nor did the bluish spear-shaped mouths of the gaping birdlings wide straddled either for begging or from passive defiance ill match the young green sedges and the upspringing marsh weeds around one over modest or bashful youngster evidently for his size the eldest of the family certainly resented our one or two minutes interview and pushed out a leg threatening to jump overboard until we dissuaded him not to when he quietly submitted and squatted again with the other youngsters on that worse than slovenly platform which was on a par for artistry with the rickety platform of a wood pigeon's shakedown our guide was careful though trying not to show it that our coming should not be unduly wearisome to the young natives of which he seemed genuinely proud 
he assured us that six eggs had been laid here but that one had been a hopeless one and that he had taken a much too large eel out of one nipper's gape and so had probably seft its life we heard the male bittern's unmusical boom and what shall i liken it unto saith an old nature book writer the mire drum from the noise it makes which may be heard a long way off it imitates the bellowing of a bull and will give four five or six bombs i thought our friend the bellower's boom seemed a bit broken and that it boomed haphazardly as if troubled or excited probably we had made it so now it came on the light wind very like the sound you make when blowing into an empty bottle now it seemed tinny like the deep-throated blast of a faraway lugger's siren and kept on varying in continuity as well as in intonation this booming was not a dreadful noise as described by another old writer it was weird eerie rare unique to me it was music sublime and appropriate as are most of the cries of the open there is one cry however nowadays heard upon our rivers from fretful stake down billy goats upon the banks that would get on the nerves of a patriarch our motor car waited and directly we were spinning along country roads towards caister where my friends deposited me on a tram car at nine i emptied my boots of water and hung my clothes to dry small inconveniences to a case-hardened haunter of Braden, who usually gets his money's worth of fun and interest even in the most untoward circumstances and mine was not a despicable bit of broadlandering within the four short hours End of chapter 5chapter six of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain a riverside philosopher i do not value chiefly a man's uprightness and benevolence which are as it were his stem and leaves i want the flower and fruit of a man that some fragrance be wafted over from him to me and some ripeness flavour our intercourse by thoreau our run down kendall dyke on a free wind was soon accomplished we disturbed no birds for they were quieter in obscure corners of the reeded sounds then in the open save a parcel of swans whose dark downed young were beak pulling at water weeds three feet below the surface whilst their cone-shaped tail ends bobbed like fishermen's floats above it we met a flotilla of the popular twenty-footers tacking up the narrow dyke threading it in herringbone fashion so my skipper had to do as approaching boats should do give and take however reckless cars may be a road sailing folk are courteous at least for self-preservation's sake had it been my turn at the wheel i fear i should have stood by and watched this procession but my skipper's mathematical mind revelled in imaginary angles and such like euclidean propositions and he ran our shuttle of a boat through those six cross-stitching shuttles 
with the sureness of a weaver's carpet patterns i verily believe we might have cracked walnuts between boats had we been so minded but we never touched the martham ferry was closed hay carts and tall wheels rumbled noisily upon it as did the shod hoofs of sturdy horses it was rather late for the marshman's harvest ending tufts of hay and marsh stuff tumbled on the pontoon as the springless tumbrils jolted and on the marsh roads as they jerked over loose flint stones and in hollows a pert little octogenarian clad in homely attire and with straps below his knees as land workers wear them like horatio held the bridge a felt hat topped his wise small grey head and a fringe of fox-tinted beard half mooned his aged chin billy as his co-workers called him acted as ferryman levering off and chain manipulating the heavy pontoon in and out the gap out as impatient yachts folk needed and closed when hay wagons at spells demanded billy had a lively tongue soft at will as a cat's paw when her claws lie perdu and also voiced frank even tart opinions upon men and things which spoken in the dear old norfolk brogue warmed my heart towards this rustic riverside philosopher a wagon had just rumbled over and old man started to shift fallen hay looking up he spake now then together do you want to go true Bull, said i we do i'm coming true as soon as you shift your old pontoon you very clever young man he rebukefully remarked but by no means offensively i thought of the forty-two children of bethel who mocked elisha and i relented i know how sanguinary can be too she bears but i'm broad norfolk myself i said and i'm proud on it well then i aren't he snapped and if i'd had yar chances of being educated i'd speak plain english bravo i thought but i saw i had ruffled the dear old boy's feelings the boats were speedily true the walrus wallowing through last in the procession and we moored at the bank opposite bracy stave myself much disappointed as i had hoped to angle there in ten feet of water in a hole where bream bit ravenously at night in eighteen ninety five and eighteen ninety six it was now a tangled maze of water weeds and lily pads after tea i rode in the dinghy flory to the bridge to chat with my client for at seven thirty horatio was still there dogmatic and garrulous a wagon over much jolting broke its connecting pin when fore-end and tumbril dissolved partnership and the hay and all went over billy looked dismayed the carters much annoyed the horses were led home and the wreckage left until the morrow and the old man had well earned his night's repose a short way off i espied an angler sitting late patient as a cormorant a gentleman every inch of him in dress and manners and as his exquisite voice and musical english proclaimed him 
it is ill speaking to ask getting any bites of an angler so i merely sauntered by remarking on my own ill luck he asked a question or two and waxed reminiscent he knew norfolk fish haunts well as much so as his own devon and its trout he revered old isaac and he loved the open air do you know anything of braden he asked i have lately read with pleasure a certain book upon it he mentioned the title and i assured him that i knew the author as well as i knew myself he looked held out his hand and we shook how small the world does seem at six thirty next morning our porridge platters had been spooned clean and soon after my skipper was put ashore to go to town on business three young amateur yachtsmen lay berthed a little way off one sturdy fellow with a blue-black chin came and tapped on the cabin top could i lend them a razor they had lost theirs of all fellows to approach but i remembered that captain kettle had recently shorn his rigid stubble and found up his blade and handed it out a gentleman from another yacht sauntered up and we nodded i opened out on hobbies the bait took and he soon told me that china and old pottery was his so we talked worcester and staffordshire and he had once bought a toby jug genuine in a cottage for fifteen shillings and sold it at a sale for fifty pounds i wondered why he did not write books i sometimes earned tuppence an hour at the game thus do strangers chum up on the broads acting neighbourly forming friendships whilst some passionless natures are as frigid and standoffish as the gilded tin cock on st nicholas's spire on a norally wind treating the townsfolk with aloofness and disdain billy turned up fairly early as did the wagoners with their new pin for the damaged one i rode over and offered billy a helping hand which he gladly accepted i praised horses as he showed interest in them although no favourites of mine i remarked that they looked like being ousted by motor machinery bore said he hosses are comin into their own again and cited one instance where they had ten of them on one farm come back to replace steam ploughs and mechanical power and don't you talk of the good old days for they were bad uns he'd had enough of turnips and small wages in his young time chapels yes village chapels had been useful in sweetening the life of the poor rustics and educating them and teaching them that afore god all men were equal he'd knowed what it were in his younger time to earn a bob a day and to try and live upon it he hadn't much to thank the squire and the parson for and said it with a decided snap and they'd got the woat and used it and wath a stiff lip billy had got a good listener well old chap i hinted one man's as good as another and a dow sight better i don't know how he interpreted this dictum it was one slightly beyond his own philosophy but billy and i had to part company for the last loads of hay were being hurried up and we ourselves had to start downstream 
so i caught the old chap's hand and before his independence of spirit had time to show itself i said in his ear you go to the methodist chapel don't you yes i do he answered certainly then i won't offend you by this slipping a coin into his hand put that in the collection box on sunday ah boy that i'll do said old friend billy and i knew we were wholly reconciled at noon captain kettle had returned with stores for the lazarette he had been much bored by last night's contribution of mosquito bites of which i had not one to show although i had swatted a fat insect on my hand that left a streak of someone's blood two inches in length the ammonia liniment was applied with soothing effects we started as usual with a head wind and plenty of it we lost it in negotiating the bridges but met it again beyond folks were at midday mealing and a busy queue they looked on the port bank some dining in the cockpit others inside the cabins most stared wonderingly at the walrus as at a floating sea monster and here and there one added sarcastic remarks which might have been returned handsomely had i not remembered the patch nailed on a port-side plank i dare say a cage of monkeys floating by would have convulsed some who see fun in everything a big yacht the iverna splendidly handled by a sturdy skipper like a cornered white whale dashed by making short boards and claiming some attention not unmixed with admiration her long unicorn-like bowsprit looked dangerously superfluous in such restricted waters and made some at anchor breathe quickly but there was always an inch or two's margin of safety but when she reached less crowded reaches her bowsprit mowed down the slim reeds in long swathes to jump erect again at its passing such sea rigs on broadland waters do not seem at home to-day among the handsome handlesome sloop riggers with their genteel jib sails but it was for all that a very pretty bit of manhandling that her skipper and owner may well be proud of we reached thurn mouth at eventide and at my desire the skipper turned the boat's nose towards a lone spot where beside tall reeds we made fast and so having settled for the night lifted the cockpit's trap and proceeded to bail and count up the day's takings after our heavy tacking net result twelve buckets of thern water which made no difference to the river although it did to us then the skipper left the tiller for the kettle and got late tea on the way whilst i squared up the raffle in the cabin in readiness for turning in and having lighted the lamp sat a while reading and gossiping at intervals i could not but help thinking that this wild corner lonely as it is at summer eventide must be forlorn enough on wintry days to any one but a naturalist the rattling of the kettle lid broke my reverie and we sat to an enjoyable repast so soon can one come back from dreamland into the real and physical one by even the most insignificant things of life but my skipper is usually a man of few words and long spells of silence with which i do not quarrel 
i admit i belong to a species of animal which is highly gregarious like elephants but even they have rogues which go solitary and take no delight in society of their own kind i enjoy periods of seclusion hence these driftings around and lonely wanderings on marsh and seashore and have wondered that had i been marooned like crusoe i should have quoted cowper o oh, solitude where are thy charms that sages have seen in thy face better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place but crusoe was not a naturalist whose most compatible chum is solitude to such a one the wee birds prattle around him the water voles frolic heedless insects dance and flirt and flutter across the pages of his book in the lamplight the more orthodox man afloat delights in the society of his fellows when the day's run is over the yacht is by preference or by custom moored at a stathe in the company of its fellows and night is made companionable and bright by lamp and music and song and laughter the social instinct predominates robust manhood amateur and professional from the yachts in merry mood repair to the waterside inns prompted more by kindred tastes than thirst as men draw to their clubs in other spheres to talk tax and jibes and water law generally the poet crab well describes the cult in his terse crisp rhyming when they come for pleasure in their leisure hour and they enjoy it to their utmost power in small smoked room when curling fumes in lazy wreaths arise and prosing topers rub their winking eyes when the long tail renewed when last they met is spliced anew and is unfinished yet well every man in his own order every son of man to his own inclinations End of chapter 6「Seven of the Cruise of the Walrus on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ghost of the Abbey. For the most part, there was no recognition of human life in the night. No human breathing was heard, only the breathing of the wind. As we sat up, kept awake by the novelty of our situation, we could detect only a ripple in the water, ruffling the disc of a star. At intervals, the throttled cry of an owl, a sudden pause, and deeper and more conscious silence by thoreau dirk when introducing concord to his english readers remarks a gentleman rows a few miles up a river and returns he spends a week in doing this and several hundred pages are required to epitomize a record of it at this moment i sit in the walrus's cockpit with this charming volume in my hand i have been condoning the philosophy skipping the historic and revelling in the nature word pictures presented at intervals like chaste etchings as he has portrayed them to me these are the sunlight which breaks through masses of majestic clouds 
moving across the azure evening draws on apace carefree yachts folk have made fast for the night in crowded and in lone places and my skipper lies asleep upon his settle in the cabin he is far too mathematically minded to be sentimental although the magic of the broadlands at rare intervals takes possession of his being few there be who feeling intensely like thoreau can interpret their impressions and emotions in written words that startle or that recall solomon's apt aphorism a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pitchers of silver there was ushered in an eerie night wrapped in a silence that was broken only occasionally by the harsh but befitting cry of a heron the thin shrill screech of a nocturnal bat answering him back and the sluss of a fish making drifting rings upon the tidal water i sat there captivated drinking in the delights of a summer night the sun disappeared unobserved over the marshes in a dim grey pall behind us and the old grey ruins of the abbey became silhouetted against a background of drabness that was broken for a short space where a streak of feeble moonlight struggled to illumine the gloaming slowly fades away the sunset glow and o'er the mist-wrapped marsh the plover wails the wheeling night-jar glides with mothly flight shade and shadow blended in darkness the unseen reeds drooped their leaves without a quiver and the little warblers and the young swallows slumbered in their fastnesses among the gnats and midges that had survived their onslaughts at sunset to be warred against once more when the morrow sun hath dispersed the night dews a ghostly owl upon his silent down textured pinions tripped inaudibly through the calm night to break the hush with a startling cry across the river that made the little field mice anxious and to scuttle into their burrows somehow one's mind becomes attuned to the ghostlier sounds of the night which seem so much in keeping with its solemnity and impressiveness as if says one writer it were the dark and tearful side of music when ghosts walk and spirits flit i recall to mind the ancient bradener sitting in his tarry noah's ark beside the cabin stove who on hearing in the night the mournful chorus of some night-flying gulls suddenly started and pointing upwards awesomely made remark hark to em they're alist at that game of a night time why can't them old fishermen what her turn to gulls lave us a learn no footstep announced his coming nor was i taken aback as i turned when the well-remembered voice of my old friend the monk of st bennet's abbey broke the stillness so thou art abroading once more my son quoth the aged benedictine as i caught a glimpse of him standing in a gapway between the reeds there seemed to be a strange light illumining his presence which did not however disconcert me hence i boldly answered him back welcome my father and so thou dost still haunt these venerable quarters i remarked that do i friend said he 
but the centuries have found me growing unrestful although not for my sins and he crossed himself but i am longing for that rest that remaineth and the peace of forgetfulness his voice had lost that jovial and vivacious ring which distinguished it at our last interview and there seemed the ghost of a tear in his eye many are the changes which i have witnessed here around he went on for a full seven hundred years have the abbey grounds been consecrated when egbert was king there was here a chapel of wood erected by saxon recluses when the wolf and the wild boar roamed in weedy swamps and scrubby uplands later in a d ten fourteen wolfric and after him svein the dane made history here and then the latter's son king canute of blessed memory who disguised himself as a swineherd in order to inspect and fathom a lie came hither and disproved certain ill reports he founded the abbey and enriched it for many centuries the abbey prospered until a traitor abbot a curse upon him betrayed and delivered us into the hands of henry the eighth in fifteen thirty seven and who at the dissolution despoiled us and gave us over to the philistines and nobles who with or without written permit filched lands and swamps and pools and broads i suggested but you enjoyed some good and rare times and seasons old man i said that did i he assented for the time was when we lived on the fat of the land venison and flesh of wild boars bustards and curlews heronshaws and rabbits pheasants and trichis pheasants and partridges i ejaculated in surprise that had we he went on smiling rather sadly we had hickling spoonbills also cranes and widgeons larks innumerable and mallards bitterns and grey lag geese in abundance from the waters we had great sturgeons and salmons not to mention pikes and burbots smelts and silvery sea trout and porpoises and divers others of fish and game from fen and hillsides wood and brecklands and from the rivers and the sea our tables creaked with fat things and the fragments of our broken victuals which were not seldom choice delicacies were given unto the poor which ever did crowd our gates surely father you must have pauperized the serfs and henchmen and encouraged the poorer people nay my son not so fast he said reproachfully charity is long-suffering ever and turn none away neither the deserving nor the lazy it was our almoner's task daily to give unto them the broken meats and the doles what i said incredulously doles surely a mixed evil as in to-day hearken unto me he insisted our table was over bountiful our monks grew dainty and the poor were many although some were tramps yea tramps who roved from convent to convent from monastery to monastery working not at all but fattening on the bread of idleness a state document described them as 
valiant mighty and idle beggars and vagabonds drove beasts and mitres or melchers which should be driven away and compelled to labour and there were some sorry rascals among them the breed is not yet exterminated i remarked but he continued the sturdier of these pressed to the front shouldering away the widow and the fatherless but our almoner insisted that the weaker be first served at that moment the grunting and squealing of disturbed swine was heard across the river i was recently viewing the abbey ruins i said and lo the sacred precincts were defiled by a dozen huge fat swine that rooted up the turf and soil of the marshland seeking roots and grubs hath circe cast her spell upon the priests he held up his hand and rebuked me how came you by so much game i asked turning the subject the fish i told you of in nineteen nineteen the wild fowl received we from the falconers and squires birds of prey abounded it was quite a commonplace to see kites chasing larks and quails the peregrine harassing rook and mallard and shoveller and rousing the wood dove from the treetops there came to the abbey princes with gyre falcons squires with jerkins and tassel gentles and right fair ladies with merlins on their gloved wrists a riding proud palfreys the yeoman favoured the goshawk a handsome bird which was common then in eastern england as well as imported from germany which was much sought after for its daring and energy and which attacked the largest game with much speed overtaking it by a continued flight rather than by stooping and pouncing upon it as doth the peregrine its docility begat for it the name of gentle falcon he left off here as if awearied and sighed you interest me greatly my father i said speak on i remember me he continued that once john paston of caister galloped up to the abbey in 1472 i think it was he was keenly eager to possess a goshawk to replace one that had killed for him bustards and hares and also many hernshaws and itself had been impaled and slain upon the shrewd bill of one rumour had reached his ears of a haggard hawk a wild one that haunted the abbey grounds killing prey for itself later he wrote to the abbot as followeth right trusty friend i commend me to yow prayin yow too and i ax no more gods of yow while the world standeth but a goshawk i am dyin for this hawk i pray god send me my mwid or moulted goshawk in haste or rather than fail a sour or young hawk written at norwich date etc signed j paston i fear me my friend that john paston was unlucky with his hawks but later some squirely joker did dispatch unto him a magpie for he wrote i see the pie and heard it speck and be god it is not worth a crow be god it were a shame to kep it in a cage you told me once my father of henry the seventh coming to the abbey in fourteen eighty six this man the king 
much appeals to my imagination as do most outlandish lovers of the open was he not great with the falcons he was indeed answered the monk but i did not like him greatly he was an unpleasant person dour haughty of mien niggardly and covetous and when he visited the abbey neither dispensed largesse nor kindly words to those who served him and moreover was exceedingly vain and overdressed and loved only himself our abbot summed him up as a blood-sucking vampire out for shekels with the snout of a shrew-mouse the conscience of a dung-hawk or skewer-girl and the cunning of a fox and no similes could have been more befitting not one good word hast thou said of him said i well he had certainly a redeeming feature here and there my son went on the monk he encouraged the flemings in our midst and it was they who taught the east coast folk to turn desolate heron haunted swamps into rich pastures and he made the country peaceful after long bitter years of warfare for the people were over wearied of the feuds of the roses he vastly enjoyed hawking when here over the luddam and the abbey marshlands sending us in many bitterns herons and mallards besides bustards and other game not for a wonder disposing of such as he needed not as some titled folk do send their netted wildfowl and shot game to-day to leadenhall market such a thought may have escaped his cupidity of spirit forsooth he had a queer wit had henry for instead of hanging lambert simnel the baker boy who aped earl of warwick and became a rebel a year after the king had been hereabouts he made a scullion first of him and then clad him in a falconer's jerkin and sent him hither and a right smart falconer he was i must be going my son tarry a while longer old man i prayed him i will for a little while he said continuing for there was much gaiety at times that break our fasting and ill days when the abbot insisted upon chastisement of our bodies when our tables held but slender provender meet only for a recluse coal-wort boiled and served up in a wooden platter seasoned with naught better than a pinch of salt and no richer an accompaniment than a hunch of coarse barley bread in very modest proportions whilst the water pitcher furnished our only beverage yet memories of these interludes waxed but hazy when the tables creaked with temptations to gluttony and when a flask of baccarat wine of the first vintage and of great age had been rummaged out of some spider-webbed corner of the cellar had been brought in by a lay brother who acted as porter and they were as merry a crew in the kitchen serf and porter page-boy and falconer scullion and kitchen-maid who followed in the train of belted knight and nobleman and squire and fair lady how lustily they sang grace before meat and how merrily they sang after it all such refrains as these the friars of fail drank nut brown ale the best that ever was tasted the monks of st bennet's made good kale on fridays when they had fasted 
with rooster and pigeon and bustard and widgeon a right merry crowd were we sing hey try tricks and trim go tricks under the greenwood tree troop squire and dame with falcons game yeoman and knight and jester or quaking swamp the horseman romp yon hern the hawk shall best her how the palfreys race tis a famous chase we will sit us down and see sing hey try tricks and trim go tricks under the greenwood tree my father i said as the sound of a sigh escaped his lips thou must feel lonely and i sorrow for thee i would that i could speak words that would comfort thee right well my son he made remark i know that thou speakest truly for thou hast a soft heart for all who may be sad and are tearful but yonder heap of broken masonry is all that remains of the abbey's past glory man that is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down he fleeth as a shadow and continueth not sic transit gloria mundi i awoke with a start it was past midnight hour i rubbed my eyes wondering whether so real seeming an adventure could be but a dream i instinctively called the monk by name but only the rippling of the tide answered me my lonely friend having departed peradventure he had gone to join himself unto the wandering jew who from an excess of zeal tradition says spat upon our lord and mayhap they will yet enter into the peace eternal and the abiding rest that shall never more be disturbed nor broken o oh, thou hallowed and venerable old pile thy sacred tapers lights are gone grey moss has clad the altar stone the holy image is overthrown the bell has ceased to toll the long ribbed aisles are burst and shrunk the holy shrines to ruin sunk departed is the pious monk god's blessing on his soul End of chapter 7chapter 8 of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain lusty barton bream but i early learned that from almost any stream in a trout country the true angler could take trout and that the great secret was this that whatever bait you used worm grasshopper grub or fly there was one thing you must always put upon your hook namely your heart when you bait your hook with your heart the fish always bite it is a morsel they love above everything else i have seen the born angler take a string of trout on the most unpromising day by john burroughs the american naturalist in locusts and wild honey has told us but half a truth for an angler must put his heart and soul into his craft or he will not excel but it is as certain from another point of view that he has no heart or why do the gaspings the mute terror 
the slow suffocation of his victims make vain appeal to his pity it must be that i make small bags and usually none at all because i cannot to-day go wholeheartedly into the contest but all the philosophy in the world will never exterminate the angler and i frankly admit that he appeals to me as much as do his fishes his hobby lures him to the quiet haunts that isaac walton loved and to whose gentle heart and dulcet pen the world owes a very great deal the dawn of the seventeenth broke smilelessly the greyness of the night scarcely touched at sunrise save where a few streaks of silvery shining away to the eastward heralded the coming of a new-born day the abbey ruins at three were in deep shadow a mysterious sphinx-like pile fit monument to a long dead past a sort of sentinel keeping guard over the bones of long dead monks and friars at seven tea was brewing and the bacon a frizzling when my matter-of-fact cook and steward recalled me from my reverie to the grosser animal delights the sky looked troubled as we cast off our moorings and hauled in the slack of the main sheet and pointed our stem towards the ant a gust of wind smiting our lug sail and wildly jibing it with more than a threat to lift the mast with it the walrus rolled heavily and righted herself in a twinkling then the spirit of the wind relented and rain besprinkled the cabin top after ventosus's parting kick swallows flew dejectedly traping low along the reeds where probably their game clung for shelter one could distinctly hear the snap of a swallow's mandibles as it came by and whipped up a dislodged fly from a reed stem one of the crew on deck was sufficient for a wet half hour so i turned in and amused myself scribbling a short article for nature land on the natterjack toad a little breeze shortly cropped up and behaving somewhat to our advantage we again spun merrily along making the most of every slant of wind we carried the wind to the shadow of the ruler thumb ludham bridge lowered in a trice the sail and whipped out the mast our speed carrying us through and beyond it and the sail was filled again without losing way and on and on we sped doubling curves as a greyhound doubles with its quarry at the foot of hell hill the halter of the walrus was hitched to a stump the skipper stropped his razor and smoothed the folds of his favourite necktie the lord high admiral browned his boots and brushed his hat and together we wended our way up the slope to the white house where a warm welcome awaited us and a civilised lunch was here our portion made the more appetising by the pleasant gossip of kindred spirits iron sharpeneth iron so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend our host and hostess sauntered with us down to the stave and bade us godspeed to the accompaniment of a camera's clickings the ant meandereth between green marshes and moreover convolves with a serpentine progress on the tides calling to mind the yokel's honest opinion that them as ploughed that there furrow 
ought to have seed to it, it were done a bit straighter. In consequence, our progress was erratic. What we gained on one tack was lost on the other. Nearing Ersted Shoals, we did a bit better, notwithstanding the canopying of the trees, which make for beauty, because the draught was in our favour. I hailed a couple of natives at work upon a stack, but they proved fractious, like browsing bears, and were unworthy of answering back. Peradventure other wasps had stung them, so we desisted. Bravo, Barton Broad! How it wooed us to a rollicking spin upon its clear waters, now as bare of weeds as a sandy beach, and so merrily did our walrus take to it that we wound in and out, for fun of it, among reedy islands and in rushy bites. The absence of weeds, the lily-pad acres and swathes of snaky herbage seemed so remarkable to me that I inquired, when I could, the meaning of it, and was told that last year's salts had crept upstream and into the broad, mingling with the fresher waters, to the destruction, more or less, of the subaqueous vegetation. This seemed feasible enough. I was once asked to suggest a remedy for a polluted but pretty broad connected with a river by a ditch. The bream were attacked by a fungus which killed off many and had weakened others. My suggestion was clean out your ditch and let in river water. If on a certain state of the tide a little salinity comes in, all the better. What if too much runs up? Then construct a sluice gate. A vast improvement followed the experiment. So, putting two and two together, H's little broad and Barton's splendid sheet made four. In other words, there was a corresponding result. Anglers had got to know that Barton Bream were well on feed, and their boats dotted the waters in all directions, as cormorants line sea rocks. They fished in couples, and, like greyhounds, gave no tongue. There were fair ladies also casting angles. Isaiah's prophecy seemed not for them. The fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle in the brooks. The only other reference to angling in the book is in Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 15, where the anglers seem to have had better luck, for they rejoice and are glad. An evidence, certainly, of the scaly ones being madly on the feed. From all accounts, our lady anglers had something attractive about them, like one of the ancient days. She was used to take delight, with her fair hand, to angle in the Nile, where the glad fish as if they knew who twas sought to deceive them, contended to be taken. Ah, those wiles of lovely woman, and how apt she is at playing big fish on taut lines. The wind did not fail us until we reached Stalham Stave and jumped ashore at Southgate's yacht place, when, as if we had no more need of its services, it quitted. The run up Stalham Dyke had been a far less laborious one than when, in extremis, I hitched my salvage job to the tow rope of a tiny motor craft in 1919. By the time we had finished tea, 
some of the anglers boats returned i saw part of one catch laid out at southgate's door partly spread there for the lucky angler to gloat over and for the entertainment of any onlooker who might pass by the angler who is usually a bit of a naturalist hath the latter's instinct to show his prizes to another that he may also share in his delight more than a baker's dozen of fine large robust bream lay there with glaze and eyes the largest quite three pounds in weight the smaller examples which were not few had been allowed to go again to grow bigger against another foray it seemed a pity that these sturdy thick-backed fish should not be popular as food the ancient poet bonsuetus probably wrote from his own experience all fish that standing pools and lakes frequent do ever yield bad juice and nourishment but here lay a spread that had made a leeds jew tailor's heart congratulate his stomach had they been his own catch or property more than a hundred years ago a writer asserted that he is a bony fish and that there is more time thrown away in angling for this fish than i think he is worth blakey sums him as being very much like a pair of bellows in shape and much the same in flavour i cannot imagine what he would have said to the fritten bream flats of the silver species whose stomachs and intestines abound with sturdy tapeworms a span each in length and a full half inch broad they have their uses for the italians esteem them a sort of subaqueous macaroni believing them to be the fat of the fish confido et conquiesco we took a leisurely ramble around proud little stalham seeing all the sights in half an hour the only thing that remains vividly in my recollection of it was a heap of worn rush horse collars the accumulation certainly of a century in a palisaded patch in the main street i missed my old late friend elmer nicholl who had joined the great majority his geniality has not passed on to his piscatorial descendant quiet bob green who today acts as guide factotum and friend to anglers who are fortunate in employing him he is an excellent henchman and that is saying sufficient next morning i crossed over to burton's granary and copied an inscription pencilled on a show card commemorating the demise of a numerous shoal of fishes which read july the fifteenth nineteen twenty two to august the fourth mr and mrs h e beach total catch three hundred weight three stone four and a half pounds bream rudd perch including nineteen tench mostly averaging two pounds bran and wheat supplied by burton at the stathe tench appear to have been unusually venturesome this season and many of them have regretted it two or three among a catch of mixed fishes have not been uncommon last evening i had bearded southgate in his den his yacht store shed he sat in glory up a corner with a bench end covered with household tutrements getting his tea his chief morsu was a succulent tench which fish 
taken from open clear waters and running streams is highly esteemed by the waterside folk of norfolk some fine tench take mutton fat baits there is something of absorbing interest to me in the medley and riot of a boat builder's shed the piecing together of a boat the cutting of strakes to follow the lines of her rake and build the clinching of rib and strake together the very smell of the smooth planed wood and the shavings the surmises of that boat's adventures to be the folks that shall man her and the manner of her ending all these sights and conjectures and fancies have a thrill for one who may let his imagination run riot southgate being in the height of his letting season had only time to gossip in snatches friday night was a sort of wind-up period to the incoming pleasure craft in the day one would come to have a quant retoed a new rope to splice a lost rollock to replace a nail to knock in here and a little job there lamps and stores to see to and a hundred other jobs incidental to the yachting industry the shed was littered with tools with stores with empty boxes with things new and old from mops to fiddles from trucks to scuppets from ballast to bed linen we laughed but were lenient over the vagaries of amateur yachtsmen one had been frightened over a refractory primus stove but it was discovered that he had placed the spreader cap on bottom upwards another could not make out why the lamp worked awkwardly and it leaked out that the body of it had been filled with methylated spirit one smart sailor sitting with the tiller in hand asked where was the rudder well is it he summed up that the yachts know their work and if they didn't interfere with them they'd pull through on their own at ten o'clock we were off again making for barton broad with a fair wind passing anglers again at work among the fishers noted the peculiarity here as in some other streams that the reed maces monopolize one side and reeds the other seldom growing together in company the banks are now shorn of their rank herbage and the glory of the wild flowers is waning called on cox the pike fisher at his obscure stave his young hopeful was nailing burst eel trunks together the good man was at the head of his dinner table we talked of eels and he described the riot they made at rowden time when the scaled fish were spawning he thought that any restrictions on eel catching would lead to lean years for anglers they even would devour the fry that survived their onslaughts on the over in a corner was a kennel where his dog resided he had been trained to watch for night moving craft and to bark his warnings in defence of the eel sets he thought certainly that many small but sizable eels came up from the sea and he had reversed his nets on occasion to catch them here and there upon poles stuck in the banks hung tarry eel nets a-drying for the eel men were preparing for the seaward movement of the eels but we never came across an eel babber fifty years ago these now practically extinct professional catchers dotted the riverways at sunset in their low open punts and freely besprinkled braden 
they spent their days in selling or sending off their catchers and wriggling or digging for earthworms other small waterside jobs and idling at their favourite pubs beguiled their leisure hours at dead of midnight you might have drifted by unknown to them locating them by the glow of their pipes and the occasional thud of the lead upon the punt floor when large eels more entangled than is usual with their teeth in the bab threads found themselves difficult of release more than a single reason might be given for their vanishing and it had become more in a starvation living past generations of eel men are forgotten and the present one their descendants have mostly sought other occupations old ben of the wherry albion loved eel stew charlie higgum was loath to sell him still more so to give him a pound or two of eels for his supper got a pound or two of small eels he asked as he sailed by only a few titty totty ones not a pound was charles's usual reply one day ben was passing again and the stereotyped reply was vouchsafed to him well i'm glad on it said old ben for my old wherry now runned into your trunk and busted it oh my gawd groaned charles and there were eight sterner big eels in there the wind in an excellent good humour wafted us through the lower reaches of the ant scarce flurrying the waters but making the pads and pods of the ripening yellow water lilies dance at the river margins and nod to us in passing and so we turned into the broader bure presently to bring the walrus to an anchor a short way up the charming ranworth dyke at a pretty nook where the alders came near to the water's edge to greet us we had plenty of elbow room although a yacht and my friend burton's houseboat were in sight and within hail until the twilight came along and then the night to blot them out and blanket us in oblivion End of chapter 8chapter nine of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain by horning town it requires some rudeness to disturb with our boat the mirror-like surface of the water in which every twig and blade of grass was so faithfully reflected on the other hand it does hold well the earth together it horning gets laughed at because it is a small town i know but nevertheless it is a place where great men may be born any day for fair winds and foul blow right over it without distinction by thoro carlyle in the u s a was in the philosopher's mind when he made this lucky shot which might equally well have been aimed at horning in his week on the concord he went through carlyle on the sunday too and scribbled sixty-two pages as the day's output the log of the walrus shows a vastly briefer entry we had scarce moored at ranworth ere a lady in a motor-boat drew up and sought our custom o tempora o mores it was a travelling confectionery stores if mahomet cannot go to the mountain 
the mountain must come to him it was a sort of glorified bumboat that took one back to nelson's time when yarmouth bummers hurried out to the fleets at anchor in the roadstead freighted with bread and green and other groceries our floating shop was laden with pastries cakes and luxuries that were scarcely befitting provender for two hungry voyagers to whom a wholemeal loaf and other substantialities would have been more inviting two shillings for a currant cake why a barrow-load of cabbages and a bag of potatoes would have been easier to barter for a florin but all who go abroading even if an hungered are neither monks nor ascetics whilst the youthful may be fanciful it had been a great day with broad proud ranworth folk and those who dwelt in the villages around showy placards had been pasted in conspicuous places where even passing boaters could row and read them there had been high jinks ashore on thursday pastoral plays an organ recital teas and amusements the village parson who had provided entertainment for his parishioners was winding up the good cheer with a gymkhana and as my skipper and i had escaped all the other water frolics on the rivers more by design than good luck we would show ourselves friendly for the village incumbent like goldsmith's parson who enters into the simple pleasures of his parishioners as well as sharing their poignant sorrows is always my friend gymkhana began at eight a record crowd hid the green slope to the water's edge and every one was on tiptoe to be pleased the aquatic sports naturally were in highest favour and there was no lack of sturdy lads and lasses as competitors dinghy races with varying stunts were distinguished more by displays of muscle than of science whilst mishap and mistake were enjoyed even more than correct performance the ranworth grebes and moorhens must have wondered at the noisy hilarity and gone into hiding as the night darkened down yachts and boats beamed and glinted with lamp and lantern and the concerter's raft with its constellation of beauty and talent became the centre of attraction when music and song floating sweetly over the waters thrilled the gay throng afloat and ashore intensifying the loveliness and the romance of a perfect broadland night at the molster's arms the more rugged masculine element foregathered to make merry in their own particular way then it was time to disperse and we four rowed by my friend in his dinghy respectively paddled back to our separate ships thoreau might have been with us in spirit read his words gradually the village murmur subsided and we seemed to be embarked on the placid current of our dreams floating from past to future as silently as one awakes to fresh morning or evening thoughts my skipper was greatly off colour on saturday morning so we idled a part of the day losing a wind we could ill spare it was as if luck delighted in fickleness and while i acted as male nurse a good samaritan from norwich came into the dyke with his big brass funnelled yacht and recognising me hung to for a pleasant chat 
i explained my idleness and my skipper's case like a good physician he thought old pa had a panacea for all indispositions and forthwith handed over the side a fat-bodied cloisterish-looking bottle a stiff dose from which acted like magic upon my invalid faith healing perhaps had a finger in it and before eventide we were under way again hoping to tide up to horning ferry our sail being too indolent even to tap its slack sides with its reefing points we were not the only idlers for those boats drifted that were ahead of us and those astern were equally lazy and lifeless it was a case of painted ships upon a painted ocean so we just sat still and lolled in luxurious reposefulness quanting without a deckway was out of the question but why worry on a holiday trip the only folk who got any excitement at all forced it out of petrol from one such passing brat came a small boy's voice oh mother said he just look that's a real catamaran what next were we to be mistaken for at length we boat hooked the ferry quayside made fast and vanderdecken and crew ashore at last stalked into the desired haven the landlord was busy outside chatting with a motorist so we were left a bit to ourselves presently he came in turning upon us a look of query as if asking what cheer i thought he came fairly well up to a certain travelling author's standard who asserts that his crib furnishes provender for the traveller's horse and whose larder provisions for his appetite he knows what a man wants so this appeared as a regular customer judging by his physiognomy sauntered in and took a certain corner as his favourite pew when it needed but a lifted hand for a full foaming mug to come into it i went myself more out of curiosity to see a typical broadland tavern than need of refreshment but ordered a lemonade as a sort of palliate and a glose for my inquisitiveness the acclimatised native evidently summed me up as hopeless and not sufficiently cordial to chum up to and he himself looked of so fruity and of so goodly a vintage that a bottle of my own beverage would have been wasted hopelessly on him i was immensely tickled by a sort of secret recess that suggested a doctor's surgery rather than what it actually proved to be an equivalent to the pot and tankard department where bottles and barrels were also hidden and herein as in a surgery dr boniface mixed his mysterious potions and drew his liquid secrets from their covert his medicines were not handed over a counter but delivered by hand or by tray to standing or sitting recipients this air of mystery seems quite a commonplace in broadland taverns the evergreen dartboard so frequently seen in inn parlours in country places had its place upon the wall and was evidently a well-used toy when idlers met and men whose forefathers drew yew-bow and sped reeded arrow against our enemies are quite content to try their skill on humbler target its bull's-eye had been often pierced and the outer circles had punches not a few 
and what ill-thrown darts went wide hit wall or door the farthest flung had sped when smoke was thickest and men's eyes were waxing hazy the wonderful newness of horning front impressed us as we drifted by cosy bungalow and monster garages busy boat sheds and gaudy inn the one small street of other days hiding itself in humble retirement behind modernity where once the eelman and the wherryman lived in obscurity yachtsman and speculator caterer and holiday-maker now predominate and given some tangible little industry i do not see why horning village should not some day become horning township with a gold-chained mayor and all his gorgeous functionaries who shall lead the place to a vaster importance and popularity the walrus loafed up horning stream but finding the tide unhelpful and a friendly breeze quite out of the question we put her about and drifted and paddled to a cutting that we had prospected on the way up and having moored for the night went for a mooch around horning streets visiting the post office the grocery store and the butcher who had however sold clean out to the last half ounce of mutton suet and put his shutters up we peered into another riverside hotel finding the bar-room crowded with clamorous youths who talked wherry and yacht and fishing boat to others who strove to outshine them and all in a reek of tobacco smoke that would have eclipsed the densest mist that ever rolled at eventide along a broadland river on sunday morning after breakfast with my best necktie neatly knotted i slipped into the dinghy flory and rode to friend utzman's the designer and maker of horning's glory and passed a pleasant hour at eleven we were afloat again upon the bure drifting salus wards with designs upon fashionable roxham with what scanty wind we could muster in the little sail we threaded a way through the mazy fleet of yachts and sailing boats finding them thickest at swan inn corner the panorama of yachts and houseboats lining the river banks made a famous show every one appeared filled or smothered with feminine beauty that radiated in the sunlight of manly adoration a silky flannelled smiling idling crowd that roxham the exclusive the fashionable the keep off my lawn and leave me radiant could not surpass but roxham was not for us to-day nor was i greatly disappointed for roxham with all its beauty oppresses me its urban rusticity its overwhelming grandiosity and interminable mileage of wind-baffling trees does not move one who finds inspiration and seldom wants for a breeze among mud-flats yet no broadland voyager should miss roxham queen of the beautiful norfolk lowlands and to the lover of the wild one visit is sufficient for a lifetime my skipper in his role of captain kettle was fractious annoyed and mortified at the perversity of the elements and when a mile or so beyond horning the tide had eased and the wind remained hopelessly irrational his remarks were not for sunday spelling yet his displeasure was cheering after his yesterday's apathy i found him better to be himself again i argued the small area of our lug sail the portliness of our hull 
the obstructiveness of the miles of alders that guarded the approaches to Wroxham from the breezes of heaven. My reasoning softened him, and he at length became as docile as the irascible little despot of Wharfdale Particular Methodists when coming in sight of his chapel with his accordion under his arm and his hymn book in his pocket. So we tidied and paddled back on the lazy ebb to Horning again, and passed cud chewing cattle upon the banks, and where Sunday idling horses lifted their heads to look at us. We were becoming reconciled almost to the chronic perverseness of the August weather of nineteen twenty two, with its skies so often painted drab its not unpleasant coolness, its dearth of sunshine, and its frequent breathlessness. But the open country saw us moving by with a sufficient breeze to make our cutwater cleave the surface to trail behind us two long bubbleless ripples that widened in the distance to a respectable wake, and ere long Horning Church, perched high on the hill that had become an almost tiresome landmark, disappeared eventually among the trees, a lonely edifice around which, in years gone by, a thatched hamlet had probably clustered, until the rustics found it to be more profitable to dwell nearer the waterside, where fluviatile pursuits were not so monotonous nor so exacting as vegetating upon the land and so taking advantage of every slant of wind and helped occasionally by the oars astern we at length sighted acle where we lashed our idling steed to the yachtsman's bank and snugged down for the night and soon there came on our first real marsh mist the densest sample that i ever saw upon our rivers which was so thick that even our burgee was lost sight of and the bow of our vessel could scarcely be distinguished the red glimmer of my storm lantern was hardly so glaring as a glowworm's torch the sound of music and singing drifted from a yacht below us on the tide and merriment that appeared a little too unrestrained for the quiet of a sabbath night had a rather grating discordant soul-jarring effect upon one to whom the soft ripple of waters and peacefulness are concord and rapture sufficient the anchored yachts had given the various skippers the chance for an evening's gossip at the riverside inn my skipper for experience more than from habit and eager to listen to waterway yarns had also drifted thither to come back in the thick fog along as dangerous a path as could well be imagined and but for my fetching him with the lantern i doubt if it had been safe for him to return the old hands knew the crinks and turns by instinct broadland skippers are to-day a sober generation and those who shall hereafter write broadland books will have scant copy over vagaries that characterise the old school a member of which my friend a h smith has so well described Noah the skipper was questioned regarding the allowance of beer per day and he at once became attentive and informing i ain't a teetotaler he said but i knows when i ha had enough and i allers say that if a man wants more than eight pints of beer a day he ought to buy it hisself eight pints a day i gasped preposterous quite right said noah tain't enough for a strong man's constitution but 
I don't ax you for more. Some men never feel so well as when they've a couple of gallons aboard. But I can't drink like an ordinary wherryman. End of chapter 9「10 of the Cruise of the Walrus on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some Bureside Folklore But a countryman shall be master of my revels. He who knows the most, he who knows what sweets and virtues are in the ground, the waters, the plants, the heavens, and how to come at these enchantments, is the rich and royal man. Nature is loved by what is best in us. By Ralph Waldo Emerson Monday morning, as I had expected, after last night's heavy mist, broke warm and radiantly sunny. After an early meal, I slung my glasses, and, stick in hand, sauntered to Acle Village, thence on to Upton, through cornfields and root crops, where a bridle path creased its way, the bending oats wiping their fat, wet ears on my coat sleeves after their mist bath, passing Hodge and his hairy hocked horses by a bankside, enjoying their breakfasts, hard by the sentinel-like church of St. Margaret's in the fields. My two-mile walk was quite sufficient for the oppressively warm air of the morning, with its flies a-following, with a persistence worthy of a more profitable occupation. The village was scarce astir, harvesting had not yet come in to speak of for the lack of sunny ripening days i found up my old friend and distant relative darkey a village celebrity at his toilet busily reaping where he had not sown the stubbles on his fertile chin i had come to exchange greetings and incidentally with a view of discussing local folklore, for Upton, I think, is the most conservative village respecting the superstitious and the supernatural that I am acquainted with in Norfolk. Scarcely knowing where to begin, I mentioned cuckoos. Boar, he said, cuckoos are unlucky birds. Think so? I innocently asked. They are, he continued. As thought wery unlucky for one to fly over the house. A sign of a death, they say. He was not yet committing himself. I know three old ladies what was over eighty, as lived all together. A cuckoo kept coming a warrantin' in their pear tree, so I took note on it, and sure enough, afore the year were out one on em died now i knowed that for a fact i could not see that it would have been anything phenomenal if they had all gone west but he would not be argified against it and what were true his dialectics were broad but interesting some folks as was careful if they set a row of taters, missed one drill, and then got rid on it. If no one knowed what become of it, well and good. Otherwise, somebody died. If a bumblebee come in the house, there'd be sure to come a stranger. He'd had one already that morning, and I had turned up. Pigs could see the wind and cried it. Cats set their tails up against it. Oh, about bees. If a bee owner died, you must put crap on their hives, 
otherwise they'd all fret and die and if you sold a hive and took gold or wheat in exchange they'd die too if a person had warts on his hand count them and tell the charmer and in a week they'd all be gone so they would if you stole a piece of butcher's suet and rubbed it on providing the butcher didn't know if a man got stung by a wiper he must catch that wary wiper and try the oil out and use it that would cure the sting people's heads itch afore wind and your scalp creeps at sea against it like many east coast country folk he had been to sea in a fishing lugger and done the herring voyage he'd sin rum things at sea he said when referring to weather wisdom and folks beliefs he'd sin wild ducks or guillemots thirty mile out with young ones under their wings they believed they hatched em at sea when gulls light on pellets or net floats or a bit of wreck that meant a gale of wind tom taylors or storm petrels we didn't like at all they portended wind some people think they live on the sea bottom if you see composants latin name corpo santo on the mast truck like a ball of fire that meant snow the village folk were great believers in herbs herb teas lotions and potions herbs that would cure every ill if you knew the right ones hempagrimony yarrow shepherd's purse broom dandelions hoarhound all had their curative virtues and if a hoss fall off his feed tansy would right side him i tried to keep him to natural objects of the seas well he said we did see rum things around the luggers there was blowfishes or small whales and sculters or dolphins what tormented the heron nets rending them in their teeth we got bottle noses or poor beagle sharks in the nets what rolled up in em with their mouths full of torn lint and cut em away and hulled em in again they want no use only to boil down for oil he'd known one old bottle nose what they recognised that went from boat to boat trying his luck and then blowfish regular skimmed the water for herons he'd seen birds flying across the north sea certainly he'd seen larks and linnets leave holland and fetch and land at winterton had had heron spinks or gold-crested wrens pick at the scales on the nets poor things and draw into blocks anywhere to sleep being so done up french sparrows too or bramblins in fogs and regular fights with starlings and others in the rigging for places to rest on little buds fell in the sea regular done up and gulls got em much more interesting information was vouchsafed to me that to narrate in detail would become irksome and our walk back together by a marsh path winding between ditches the crumbly soil of which had been delved up to form it still found darky holding forth the pathway was beset with clinging brambles giant yarrows and gaunt marsh thistles over which danced peacock and tortoiseshell butterflies and gay insects of various species the moistness of the way and the heat of the sun made the scramble through clinging weeds a wearying process made the less trying perhaps 
by my companion's knowledge of marsh flowers and their many virtues and when we arrived at the walrus he sat upon the bank and still expounded the wisdom of the norfolk ancients at noon we set sail again and proceeded slowly downstream having shot Acle Bridge by oar upon the ebb, picking up a bit of wind here and there, but, as usual, finding very little, so we had to grin and bear it. The Acle New Road ran almost parallel to the river, and with its windmills dotting the landscape at every point of the compass, recalled the pictures we had seen of Holland, the long lines of low willows, the lanes of ditches adding vastly to the similarity. We got ashore at Stracy Arms to watch the rescue of a large and valuable motor car by Crane and Crank that had run into a deep ditch in last night's blinding mist. What mattered what beguiled us, since Ventosus had gone to sleep, and our little red burgee hung limp as a broken twig. Captain Kettle thought otherwise, and watched the sail as a spider ogles its web. For miles but one yacht had passed us, and she, with her huge spread of sailcloth, ran aground, to pick us up again a mile or two downstream but her troubles did not minimise ours nor the fact that probably many other crafts lay idling still for want of a breeze lost days were as nothing to them for want of a set programme one bit of broadland being as interesting to them as another besides with main and top and jib sail they could move along while our bit of a tablecloth was still thinking it over. At Morby, deep waters ceased to lave the river walls, considerable ronds lying between them and the river, whilst tenacious mud patches stretch out below the shallows and make progress a ticklish process. I suggested we should throw a tow rope ashore and lower the sail and mast on the crutches and take turns at towing so making a loop i sprung out on a rond and put on the harness the skipper sitting aft tiller in hand with an oar lying handy against grounding the walrus pricked her ears so to speak and meekly followed now and then with all our contriving bumping her keel and billage on little hummocks of broken rondage but glancing off with a bit of humouring the tramp along the velvety grasses was not unpleasant after long sitting the strain was not great having the tide under her indeed i enjoyed it for this ancient exercise in me conduces to a pleasant abandon wherein one's memory riots in old-time doings, when, in early mornings, I rambled here around after plover and duck, or threshed the river for bream or roach. Moonlit evenings come back to mind, when walking gunners picked each other up, and talked hares and mallards and lapwings, not to mention strange old fellows whose exploits illegal and otherwise made for merriment and laughter most of these old comrades in arms have passed over the great divide and their like will never be met with again but my reverie was occasionally broken by a jump across an oozy rond gap or a run round another too wide to risk it and a clamber over an occasional marsh stile. These kept one alert ashore, and also demanded the vigilance of the man afloat, who had to drop the tiller now and then to take the oar and push the craft a little astern and out, 
and lash with his tongue whatever cause he thought most deserving of blame now i am moderately content with the condition of the lower bure and knowing these provoking reaches as a rule escape calamity but the state of the river is to-day an abomination causing amateur yachtsmen much heart-burning and frequently placing young fellows in an awkward scrape as when say speeding home with the yacht due at a certain date to find themselves stranded in lonely places and their purses at very low ebb this our little bit of experience as galley slaves seemed to tickle a group of yokels at morby mill who were busy on a haystack they bawled flat jokes which lost half their meaning by distance and they kept up a running fire of banter while we were struggling to clear a nasty shallow i eased a moment to rend one fellow with a remark that exactly fitted him and while they sorted it over very slowly we tried again and succeeded in getting clear again in silence i think someone on the hay had recognised john no little then came my skipper's turn at the tow-rope and he too had incidents of grounding upon shoals blaming me rather than the unseen obstacles in the turgid waters he might at least have kept silence rather than making startling observations only a job who paid river tolls and had had a dose of bureside towage could reasonably have asked is there iniquity in my tongue and again if i justify myself mine own mouth shall condemn me if i say i am perfect it shall also prove me perverse a half mile from the first steam mill we were actually aground near the middle of the stream i found there was fun in it only i was getting terribly hungry my kindest wish was that the norfolk and suffolk yacht club's committee boat shall some fine day with all its leading lights aboard ground at the last named spot on a falling tide with night approaching and may i be there to see to make appropriate comment we had the worst yet to come from that smelly horse slaughterhouse corner to the destructor a cheerless locality at low water in the gloaming with far-reaching muds freely besprinkled with flints and bricks and lumps of concrete and here and there a half submerged and unwanted dog kindly hidden from at least one's view in a sack we had to add an extra length of rope and even then my towman walked almost parallel to the creeping ship there is one man on our rivers who seems never in a hobble and never anything else when i have met him but merry bob tooley is known to every river goer and his spurts of broad norfolk and the pert way he carries his plumpness are equally worthy of note he handles a quant three times longer than himself as neatly poised as a trout fisher his favourite rod its toe goes with a snap into the mud and its head finds its niche in his strong shoulder and forthwith bob starts his goose step along the wherry's plankway never himself gaining an inch of way although the craft goes forward under his soldier-like tread scented soap is one of bob's weaknesses said bob one day when passing us you're getting on and then went on to tell us of a horse that was obstinate that's like this here he said 
we got a order to shift a hoss so we took the wherry beyond stokesby way and lay to we was to put him athwart the river to save a fourteen mile round well we got a halter on him and three or four on us got him along till by a lot of contrivin we got one foot on the forepeak then the warmin wouldn't budge an inch language warn't no use nor fair words and the more we worrited the wuss he was so we considered a bit and then says i give us the winch rup and i puts a hank or so round his neck and knotted it now i says you blank gentleman you'll hat a go so i says to the chaps jist you buck him up and i'll crank and we cranked him on the forepeak and done the job for him the blank head to come merry old tooley i suggested to my skipper that tooley's winch with tow rope enough would have been just the thing from stokesby ferry to yarmouth yachting station to have met our case at very long last in the dim light of a flickering quayside lamp we moored to the decaying piles a few paces northward of the first of the three bure bridges fumbling with ropes to fix on any spike head that offered at least a tolerably safe anchorage and hanging fenders to keep the ship's planks and combings off the rusted naked bolt heads that careless pile drivers ought to have buried in the fibres of the wood the skipper preferred to remain aboard in this smelly region known as yarmouth yacht station the inky sewerage water trailing from an outlet above us bedaubing our water line as it trickled with the stream to make a more definite ruling on the swan-like hulls below us moored at the station proper i managed to get a grip on a jagged pile and putting my foot on the cabin top jumped ashore not ill-pleased with our slug-like progress of the day honestly and hungered and quite resigned to this year's weather vagaries determined to pray no more for favourable breezes as doing so seemed to be a waste of choice english and a flying in the face of providence i was happy enough so why repine it is a long long waterway that has no bending or that patience and persistency will not round in the end End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of the Cruise of the Walrus on the Broads by Arthur Henry But I go with a friend to the shore of our little river and with one stroke of the paddle i leave the village politics and personalities yes and pass into a delicate realm of sunset and moonlight too bright for any spotted man to enter without novitiate and probation by ralph waldo emerson ah how many times have i eluded the turmoils of town life by slipping into my old punt yarwhelp as she ran down the rollered slipway into the waters of braden leaving behind me what makes for care and worry and unrest of body and mind to feel as free as the gulls that glided above head ministering angels in their joyous way sometimes at dawn of day when the sun peering above the reddening housetops touched with silver the ripples upon the tideway or when his great crimson orb 
flung a long broad wake of blazing gold athwart the moist bosom of braden flats when gaunt herons suspend their eel fishing to scratch their wise old heads as if in wonder at the beauty and the gorgeousness of it all in misty silence or under the twinkling stars or when crouching before a storm blast or drifting in the quiet moonlight the charm the enchantment of the old estuary has held me an awed and willing captive tuesday found us early astir and having laid in fresh stores and refilled the water bottle we hitched our tow rope to a friendly motor boat already harnessed to a couple of yachts whose defiance of the upcoming tide would not have been helped in any way by a favouring breeze so laying gunwale to gunwale each skipper at his own tiller we sped under the three bridges scarce noting the shrimp boats and the raffle of small craft that crowded each quayside and so round the knoll and its dolphins through the braden viaduct thence to the open channel by the time we had come abreast of the bordered bars at the mile point each craft had opened its pinions in our case but a single one and was prepared to show its individual capabilities the first well away was a sea-goer captained by a keen old lowestoft yachtsman she was well on for the narrows near borough when number two a sloop rigger manned by amateurs had only got abreast of the cross stake whilst the cumbersome walrus had so far made but a score of channel stakes like ourselves she craved a robuster breeze but this easy-going pace suited me well for it gave me opportunities to watch the sea-fowl winging their several ways a picking up their floating breakfasts as when drayton probably saw them here the sea-mew sea-pie gull and curlew here do keep as searching every shoal and watching every deep to find the floating fry with their sharp piercing sight which suddenly they take by stooping from the height i had fine opportunities for watching the autumnal gathering and the rollicking of the gulls already drifting in from their housekeeping resort at scolton mere with their nuptial brown hoods still upon their little wise heads and bringing with them their mottled grey young those that survive the dangers of babyhood when hungry eels and pikes and ravening rats lay hold of the downy swimmers in front of their very cradles common terns and lesser terns forsaking the shingle patches of wells and blakeney darted hither and thither throwing themselves impetuously upon the brown salt tide to rise a wing again with a silvery might of a herring held fast between their mandibles that was hurried away with to some bare muddy patch where always hungry impatient youngsters waited for their food and clamoured for it lustily as their parents hove in sight odd was it to observe a mother bird pass one and two and sometimes number three to drop the little fish into the open bill of number four the others having already had their share in proper rotation and strange as it appeared the first fed did not insist when they saw the mother bird pass them by as if the actions of their dam had been correctly understood it is most entertaining to watch the lesser terns with heads bent down and inwards the lower mandible touching the breast watching the 
to the human eye invisible green-backed herring sile fluttering dipping rising a few feet as a tiny fish comes into view and then descending again keeping the birds constantly lifting and falling never striking the water unless they feel sure their chances have not been misjudged never do you see terns like gulls sitting on the water their resting or alighting place must be solid a bulk a basket a floating box or at the worst a moderately dry mud flat i have seen a hollow square of terns asleep or preening their feathers upon a dirty straw pallias thrown overboard by some shiftless housekeeper exquisite little fellows they are these chit pearls of north norfolk an expressive phrase conveying ideas of note and colour rare birds drop in unexpectedly in april nineteen o one i sailed in my punt past seventeen handsome spoonbills upon the flats and in june nineteen o five no less than nine dainty avocets swimming on the undulating waters a rarey show indeed to-day there pass us no worries a-sailing only now and then an iron barge with a steamer hull a-towing it time was when on every ebb and flow graceful sailing wherries were moving up or down a pleasure wherry indeed passed us but looked too smart and garish to be romantic or in keeping there seemed a great still loneliness made the more intense by the fewness of the craft than if there had not passed us a solitary one fifty years ago a hardy race of smelters wildfowlers and eelmen rested a living out of braden waters and from its oozes their prey was eels and mullet flounders and mallard pochard and godwit and richer and rarer birds ere the close seasons killed one half of their livelihood when collectors outvied each other in purchasing rare and desirable birds and when a race of gentlemen gunners hired them as pilots and henchmen nature perverted by man turned swamps into grazing grounds and oozes into circumscribed well-drained cornlands up and down the valleys of the broadland rivers and braden the heart of the bird country piled up soft mud-flats into hard soil whereon the tides spread yearly in lessening inches but these changes are herein too intricate and lengthy to discuss and my reader must refer to my wild life on a norfolk estuary if he would pursue the subject for over a century these changes have been more and more swiftly moving and marked the last stake number fifty six hath come in sight and we are well over the narrows where the waters always appear to be more or less ruffled on our right is burney arms so said a voice whose owner i recognised as a sort of guide upon a crowded pleasure steamer that passed us adding plaintively which once a public house is so no longer it is needless to say that many eyes were turned to it in apparent sadness it is a drear spot and he was glad of some outstanding object to stir the imagination of the passengers yon st nicholas church once said a loquacious yarmouth brakeman on our right to no response on our left is lagan's brewery to loud cheers and much laughter 
the squat old arms could tell strange stories had it a tongue watermen and fowlers fishermen and poachers freely used it in the far away days when stress of weather or other circumstances brought or stranded them hereabouts on racing days and water frolics when the one barrel of the usual week had brought up by wherry its reinforcements prosing topers and casual visitors sat in fine evenings on the bit of green in front some mending their nets others resting on the benches with their guns beside them pot and patter true stories and otherwise of past adventures and unprofitable arguments as well as packs of playing cards filled in the leisurely hour the policeman from a neighbouring village came for company now and then with ears that itched for clues being no respecters of persons a certain pair of adventurous poachers sat at their favourite tipple one boxing day afternoon they had wandered over the marshes after lapwings and such snipe as could be openly shot hoping for any old hares that might be spending their holidays upon the frosted lowlands two village constables sat near the fire shuffling cards with a trio of smelters a hirsute native appeared in the doorway and seeing the sportsman stalked in and had a treat at their expense there's nine old coots dropped in at the back of the old reed patch you will get a shot if you hurry up said he in full hearing of the limbs of the law who sat hard ignoring such paltry game the two poaching gentlemen quietly took their departure and their guns remarking that if they bagged em they'd bring in a couple for each of the slops they did not return but when asked a while after as to their luck one of them replied coots no bore more like petridges nine on em but as we didn't fare particular thirsty we left the bobbies to their own entertainment and for out we cared they might be there yet possibly burney arms pub in the seventies was one of the loneliest of meetenhausen but for a long time the big room was used on a sunday for preaching purposes the local parsons being ferried over from borough castle in a dilapidated smacks boat providing the weather was not too wild when a drum-up was made of the five houses comprising the widely scattered hamlet two of us youths one stormy sunday walked with old john bitten a noted methodist to borough and waited for an hour on the salting for two burneyites to ferry us over but the wildness affrighted them and when they had summed up courage at length big waves broke over the boat only two natives attended the service yet the venerable john went through with it and the gale so increased that at nightfall we had to stumble and wade over the sodden marshes and down the railway line home the rain beating in our faces all the way ah what other strange tales could i not write about that wildest corner of east norfolk what bags the old race of wildfowlers made of duck and potchard scalp and tufty when snow lay deep on the marshlands and ice covered braden inches deep like a marble flooring save where the tide had cracked long black gaps leading to the main channel where the icy waters showed and into which hungry fowl by the hundred crowded 
what hauls of smelts and mullets these fishermen sportsmen made well upward mullets well they would on rare occasions nearly fill the boats leaving many bewildered fishers still in the nets kept prisoners until they could return again to retrieve them how one would like to know more and more of these men now extinct whose rusted guns long ago vanished on the scrap heap and whose nets rotted in the garrets and cellars of their children what hauls they made what skeps of wild fowl they boated home what spicy wild life wild adventurous yarns they told but to-day they are as lost to us as the stone age man who slew mammoth and pterodactyl and many a beast of stranger ravening there runs an acute angle of rons and marsh walls at braden far end against the apex of which the tidal water splits its volume to send half of its inrush up the yare and the other half up the waveney at this corner in tiny groups when i was a young man nestled several tarry old houseboats the waterside lodging houses of hardy fisher folk who but rarely saw their town or village homes not one did we see to-day for these poor fishermen have also fallen on evil days meniscus mourning for his only son the toil experienced fisher pelagon has placed upon his tomb a net and oar the badges of a painful life and poor with our incorrigible ill luck the light wind which we had hoped would carry us to Reedham, all but fell away with the turning of the tide a full half mile more and we should have turned into haddiscoe canal with an at least favouring easy-going breeze the skipper did all that was possible by tacking but losing more way than gaining it each time went into the wind he crab-clawed hauling hand over hand on the lank grasses that overhung the broken abrupt banks we rode but the quick-flowing ebb increasing its pace almost perceptibly baffled us then i essayed to jump ashore with a tow-rope and was making some progress when down i fell bodily into a large hole that had been hidden by rank grasses and tall reeds as neatly as into any buck-trap in zululand the crew losing sight of me altogether fortunately there was no broken timber inside it as in an african pitfall or i had not clambered out so quickly only once before in my many years of water spanieling had i gone into a hole and then but knee deep the oddest thing of the present incident was my coming out completely dry i scratched my head and thought of the short but truthful axiom of the frenchman bouche seri mouche ne entre and kept my mouth shut so that none escaped therefrom this was the worst and only alarming incident of the whole three weeks trip the bit of river from burney arms to reedham is to my mind the wildest in broadland and but for the traffic of the air would be the lonesomest but the rons were raggedly beautiful with rank herbage and smiling michaelmas daisies my favourite wild flowers where among droning bees and other insects swarmed and revelled a picturesque mill and a mellow red farmhouse once in a while broke the monotony of these miles of wilderness quite a company of common sandpipers tripped about the broken banks bobbing their tails funnily as is their wont 
as they pecked among the prone water weeds and in crevices of fallen clay searching for crustaceans as lively as themselves overhead small parties of curlews once thirty in a flock dotted the grey skies and piped cheerily on their migration from the northern moors the advance guard of many wading birds that later made the misty nights eerie as they halted above the lamp glow of city and town tittering weird cries which timorous souls deemed ghost-like and uncanny and thought them lamentations of the spirits that wander at night a very pretty episode in bird life attracted our attention near a marsh mill three swallows excitedly flew overhead two of them quarrelling in a very energetic fashion the third not exactly acting as umpire but all the same as having some interest in the contest in and out and round and round the three of them flew now high now low then to the millside and back to the river when suddenly one of them flew off at a tangent worsted and discomposed the couple going millwards chattering as in high glee there seemed to me something of a peculiarly human touch in this little comedy which certainly did not end in an avine divorce court but rather suggested a phase of the unwritten law at long last the tide turned and we were running merrily before a draught of wind that increased the more the farther we left the heights of Reedham behind us so much so that we bowled along to the drawbridge with sufficient impetus for the skipper who stood on the bows to lower sail and lift the mast and so shoot under the leaves of it to pop it into its place again beyond the bridge without losing way and so to the waveney and round the point and into means dyke to moor beside the houseboat moorhen the second the headquarters of my small fleet End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of the Cruise of the Walrus on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Braden in 1755. All nature appears fresh and every animal seems to rejoice at this time jet black weaver birds with bright yellow crests flycatchers bee eaters and humming birds of beautifully bright iridescent colours flit about from bush to bush whilst flamingoes pelicans herons and beautiful light blue cranes with ibis curlews and waders of different kinds may be seen winging their flights in long lines to their feeding grounds taken from the old she carry how the bundle of torn and almost indelible manuscript which purports to be the diary of one silas hardly came into my possession matters not for its authenticity i am not prepared to argue but from a careful perusal of certain entries i dare make assertion that the diarist's observations on birds and fish read truthfully and beyond doubt the items reproduced have been confined to matters which make an excellent supplement to the preceding chapter seventeen fifty five may the fourteenth having dined well at the duke's head with certain kindred spirits natives of yarmouth i repaired to cobb holm situated over the quaint wooden bridge there to meet one hernser smith a wild fowler who with his flat bottom scowl 
i had hired to go a-shooting on the marshes and saltings cobb holm is a wild desolate but to the ornithologist an interesting area of some twenty-seven acres of boggy land more saltings than marsh or fen and notwithstanding it hath for protection from spring tides a mound or wall of clay faced with flints on the water side it doth not prevent occasional floodings during wintry gales this area and a vaster beyond of swamps and pools interspersed with sedge clumps and a wilderness of reeds and marsh plants swarms with plovers in their season and many other species of water and swamp loving birds most notably a kind of seagull small and beautiful called a cob which hath a smoke-brown hood in the nuptial season and like all gulls hath not a pure white tail until the adult stage hath come to it this fact hath led to the home a lowland or flat island near a river being named cobholm or cobham be that as it may vast flocks of sea-fowl consort thither chiefly during the period of the herring fishing or its approach in smith's scow with him and two flintlock fowling pieces we left lady haven cut for the broad of Braden passing certain wherries and keels the latter laden with oaken timbers for building of the king's ships corvettes being constructed on local shipyards the saltings or rather rons as the natives term them on the waterward side of the walls or as the dutch know them dykes appear strangely as if they had been and no doubt are slicings from the mainland beyond the walls called marshes and these rons continue more or less irregular and serpentined of outline due to the abrasion of the waters on the north side to the yare and on the south side to the waveney at borough castle creeks known locally as drains finger-like vein these rons which do drain the tidal water on the ebb these also have great fringes of reeds and rushes and the velvety grass upon these rons is brightened by the sea scurvy grass in spring and the richly coloured michaelmas daisy in autumn these rons harbour many water hens and rails also various sedge birds and reed pheasants or bearded tits whilst kingfishers which few gunmen do shoot fly around dashing into the brackish waters for small gobies and herring sile and i bethink me shrimps not a few which they depart with in their mandibles in order to beat them upon some stump or convenient flintstone beneath the walls and so being dead do devour them this halcyon bird of the ancients nesteth in rat holes in borough castle by my orders smith had not brought his punt gun which swiveleth on an arch thwart across his boat and belcheth forth some eight ounces of leaden slugs at one discharge for i had come hither to observe rather than to destroy hence a sword of mallards and a dopping of sheldrakes we passed by harmlessly greatly to smith's regret although smaller game troubled him but little as only table birds attract much these hardy men several sandpipers both common and black totanus ocropus were flushed and one of the latter was pursued by a red-footed hobby which at the moment rose above the wall many ringed dotterel or plovers 
chortled musically on the rons lifting on high their pointed wings as they pirouetted around their mates several of those pretty birds called turnstones were also observed some of them turning over the dry weeds at the water mark and pursuing certain sea lice orchestria littoria that jumped from under when disturbed it was strange how resting turnstones gay as they be with ruddy tints and striking plumage should escape one's eye until a movement on their part is made and even then if one turns away and then looks back again it is not seldom one faileth at first to locate them skylarks sang loudly over the marshes filling the air with music reed sparrows with black heads and throats trilled their stammering loud songs from many a reedy perch and titlarks cheeped from every post of vantage by the walls or as they flitted around their nests in the marshy tussocks beyond the walls and even in so unexpected a neighbourhood the cuckoos cried lustily one of these with chuckling notes as in glee or in cynical mood alighted on a faggot thrusted in the soil near unto a titlark's nest the old birds much protesting by note and action and they were exceeding perturbed let me shoot the foreigner said smith with an oath prefixed and pointed his fowling piece at it i made no objection and he straightway fired at and killed the bird then strode across the rond to retrieve it on handing it to me i observed the mouth to be full of yolk and a crushed shell undoubtedly belonging to the titlarks and moreover on slitting its abdomen with my quill penknife i found in the oviduct an egg of its own ready for extrusion and other eggs in various stages of development to at least the number of twelve various wading and other fowl passed over or around us as the rising tide or some other disturbing element drove them off the flats or on their way to some still uncovered lumps or to the marshes to rest a while until at tidefall the higher portions of the flats shall be bared again knobs of widgeon trips of dunlins and knots flew restlessly around while sand martins and swallows streaked the view in all directions with their dartings and flights as we rode among the few patches of flats remaining uncovered keeping ourselves well in the deeper drains it was interesting to observe dunlins probing the ooze and drawing therefrom tiny red many-legged worms nereus with which they trotted prettily to the water's edge to rinse before swallowing them whilst mature knots in their nuptial attire of brick red and the last year's young still in the grey picked out the same abounding worms but troubling not to wash them of the ooze smith declared knots to be excellent eating and fain would have slaughtered some only that his flint missed fire and he must needs screw in another and reprime the pan of his piece a couple of yarwhelps or black-tailed godwits crying lustily their puppy-like yells of dooey looey rose ahead of our boat their contentious protests startling into flight a flock of quite two score bar-tailed godwits all of them in the red and four more of their own species are feeding with them these all hurriedly flew away catching up with them a party of even more noisy red legs 
or red shanks who are never loath to create a sensation upon the slightest pretext their yapping cluey cluey click click clee putting an instant scare into others a full mile away these all swept towards the marshes where as saith drayton by some ditch's side or little shallow lake lie dabbling night and day the pallet pleasing snite the bidcock and with them the redshank that delight together still to be in some small reedy bed in which these little fowls in summer time were bred in the meantime many black terns tripped over the waters snapping up insects that floated on their way all making in a northerly direction for upton broad where they annually nest a bunch of sholard ducks or shovelers with broadened bills bibbled gaily among the rackweeds scooping up small living shells and as we lay a-watching them through my perspective glass a large hawk or falcon swift of wing as an eagle and exceeding graceful in flight encircled above head suddenly singling out one fowl as they took to precipitate flight it doubled after it to and fro hot foot when as by a lightning stroke of taloned feet break its neck and before it touched the water limp and bedraggled the falcon had stooped and clutched it in its talons bearing it ashore to the wall to devour it we saw but two gunners afloat their quest being waterfowl of saleable proportions and of acknowledged excellence of meat most of the wading birds being rank of flesh it being springtime but for all of these they had better market in winter when they were fat and kept the better for the cooler air in all directions one saw lordly herons from the treetops of reedham and fritton woods some standing motionless asleep leg deep in water having become surfeited of small eels and flat fishes or flounders others stalked solemnly in the shallows and hungered awful food for the squabs in the treetops at home and yet others were a wing statelily betaking themselves to more promising fishing grounds clamouring redshanks were everywhere for they nest in abundance on the bure marshes beyond Braden, and even when at ease they chatter and nod their heads petulantly to the tune and there were a few cormorants mostly young ones of a dusky hue perched upon stakes near deeper water some preening their feathers others with wings a-hanging until they had assumed an m-shapen figure the wings being represented by the outside strokes of it at full tide we had rowed and drifted well across Braden, and as it turned we put up the mast and spread the spritsail having a fairly quick run home notwithstanding we had frequently to tack seventeen fifty five may the fifteenth left my fowling piece at home this day but at smith's request consented to allow him to ship his own we brought with us a bottle or so of refreshment and some comestibles my man contending that Braden provoked appetites the clinking of corker's tools sounded musically over the waters from the shipyards as did the squawking of gulls stooping and squabbling for broken fishers thrown from the fishing boats that floated upstream as we turned the half mile point smith pointed to a large bird perched upon a stake a fishing hawk he said jest watch him the bird was preening his feathers 
all the time watchful upon what was going on in the clear green water below him which seemed to abound with life presently he stood alert rose high in the air then for a space hovered kestrel-like and in an instant had plunged bodily into the stream making an abundant splash and commotion but not disappearing and as quickly was a wing again holding in his talons either a sea perch or bass or a mullet with which he returned to his post and began to tear in pieces and devour smith said that he had once seen four of these ospreys upon as many stakes and two on the wing the greater gulls did not seem to mind him but stood a bit apart aloofly yet ready to rush for any fragments the fish-hawk would discard after his meal and to quarrel with each other for possession there came athwart the mud-flats sounds as of yesterday for birds were still on migration we rode to the wall a mile or so beyond cobham and went ashore each of us with a pole of some length towed at the foot which resisted the ooze below when it was necessary for us to vault ditches or pole holes of not too wide a diameter red shanks lapwings and snipes were nesting in abundance curlews and wimbrel clamoured in a great tumult of noise to which were added the cries of other waders besides those already mentioned we found peewits eggs in hollows and beneath the tussocks mostly brownish with black spots thickly besprinkling them in the season said smith hundreds were gathered for the markets but did not appear to diminish the species and so long as gunmen were few and the marshes left undrained nature would protect many of the birds he would have it that stoats and rooks besides black crows purloined a multitude of eggs and that black-backed gulls also condescended to thieve with them and even devoured the young birds he pointed out to me some black curlews or glossy ibis which he said nested occasionally and i saw the birds distinctly through my glass also a few couples of black-tailed godwits noisy birds in all conscience i also espied a couple of avocets not more although it may be odd females were pursuing the duties of incubation whilst their mates were probably feeding with wimbrel and curlews upon the mud-flats smith said that the marshes beyond Braden, that spread for many miles had an abundant population of waterfowl and waders upon them which i can quite well believe and it was not rare to see half a dozen spoonbills any summer day in may upon the mud-flats and as for cranes and grey plovers he had seen several of the former and vast flocks of the latter which however rarely alighted on the marshes he assured me that these plovers wore black vests in spring and white ones in winter a fact which i assured him i already was aware of and that it seemed to me to be a very human touch of nature this remark puzzled him he also communicated the fact that woodcocks had not rarely bred in the neighbourhood and as for teal and tufted ducks he had known them also and as we later sailed homewards he talked interestingly of vast hordes of web-footed and other wild birds that swarmed in the neighbourhood i have not yet referred to ruffs and reeves which i actually saw upon little mounds beside ditches now as if dozing 
now all alive as if expecting a visit which as i lay upon the grass watching them through my perspective glass certainly ensued for came four ruffled birds two with a sandy hued ruff one with black streaks and spotted with white and the other richly empurpled they bowed to each other like gallant little gentlemen and then commenced to invite a quarrel meanwhile performing some grotesque manoeuvres stooping fluttering thrusting with bills and parrying with them a couple of bantam cocks would have ignored such feeble attempts at damaging an opponent and for all the fuss and display i did not see a feather pulled and whenever one seized a tiny carbuncle upon another's beak base it had not sufficient nipping power to draw blood from it now a couple of reeves would drop into the arena and look on passively their indifference seemingly adding fuel to the fiery feelings of the combatants then off they flew probably to watch another batch of disputants as vastly amused at the fuss they made to win their affections this too i whispered to smith had a very human touch at which he said just so sir as you say then an odd bird would jump into the air quite a foot off the ground but it meant nothing and presently with a common impulse the whole party would take to wing adjourning the quarrel pro tem or until they had a better mound or hillock in view with a greater interest shown in the melee by a hoped-for larger audience of the ladies seventeen fifty five may the sixteenth smith left the gun at home this afternoon and sailed the scow up channel to a party of mulleters who were about to take up their mullet nets in reality to take them down the tide as well as the hour was somewhat later than yesterday and the water was fast drawing off the flats i noted that a stake net had a somewhat small mesh and which was fronted and backed by two other nets of a vaster mesh for this reason when a mullet came into contact with the net he naturally pushed it himself passing through the large mesh and bagging himself in the lint as he drave through the outer mesh here we observed some struggling in the meshes others hanging dead having been suffocated two sea perch of four pounds weight a few medium-sized bream and a jack of three pounds besides several flat fishes and a host of shore crabs the freshwater fishes had come downstream on the ebb as frequently happens for in the finer months the salt tides do not travel far upstream indeed it is remarkable although not after all a matter of astonishment how equable the tides be and will so remain so long as the bar at the harbour mouth acts as a dam to the incoming tide nor will this be altered which the braden men do not want until the north breakwater at galston extendeth beyond the south pier after we had chatted a while with the mulleters we rode towards a couple of smelt catchers who were plying their trade with a small meshed draw net it was interesting to see them surround and finally draw ashore upon the muds scores of aromatically scented smelts which some say is comparable to the aroma of cucumbers and not untruly then we watched some eel men stabbing the ooze with pronged flat picks bringing forth fine eels are coiling round the deadly weapon and finally visiting some babbers fishing with clots of worms 
to which heedless eels hung unexpectedly as their toothed jaws became entangled in the threads or worsted and then we made for the lady haven once more much pleased to have seen this remarkable estuary here the entries finished for quite a number of leaves had been badly torn and the entries that followed referred not to Braden. End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain on norwich river for the rest the life that we were leading had become a sort of second nature and we found it by no means disagreeable we ate with healthy appetites and when night came stretched on our matting we heedlessly let the wind fold its wings or shriek into madness whilst the river either murmured gently along like a stream across the green meadow or lashed itself into fury like a lion by perez triana triana was a fugitive politician fleeing from a national disturbance in his own state down the orinoco in a canoe the new life appealed strongly to him as do the norfolk broads to holiday folk who come to them jaded to leave them regretfully in his case to write a book little known in this country but well worth a perusal in his instance he had always the ebbing tide to move him along with an occasional hurricane alligator or rattlesnake to relieve the monotony of the everlasting forest through which he and his indians drifted he had music too for tapers pumas and wild boars haunted the vicinity of his nightly pitch leaving their spore or footprints upon the banks to cheer him a few rabbits an occasional hare or even an otter would have enlivened our own adventure or even a little shrieking of the wind wind indeed we got so little of it that every slant puff flutter and breeze of it was treated as a gift from heaven to be logged as carefully as the records of other events wednesday the twenty second was an idling day taken up in rambling through wooded lanes and in overhauling lazarette and stores the only nature incident of the day was the finding by my young friend hines of a dead young rabbit probably the victim of a stoat under whose unpleasant carcass laboured equally evil-smelling necrophorus or burying beetles busily lowering it into its early grave what sleuths are these insects what marvellous powers of scent they possess to nose out a dead thing furlongs away and to follow it up the scent the dropping from a wing one after another to share in the work of egg-laying the larvae from which feeding in the dark consume the carcass in a very short space of time a certain naturalist had seen a large sheep stripped to the bones in three days on one occasion i turned over a poacher's dead greyhound to discover a swarm of these beetles doing their level best to entomb it but it seemed a task beyond their powers and perseverance at four on thursday freshly shorn and shaven captain kettle stepped aboard again and took command quite resigned now to the vagaries of the elements that carried or drave us 
we did the cut on the last of the ebb finding the yare still at ebb as we rounded the corner and steered for Reedham again as was usual tide wrong wind cut off by the higher ground patience abiding fortunately two Reedham friends espied us and came in their boat to tow us to the so-called public stave a more disreputable row of decayed timbers with raw bolt heads and a wickeder key cannot be found by yachting folk in the whole of broadland it cannot have been repaired since lodbrog the dane landed here to make a jumble of english history and send down the ages a weirdly mythical story sir henry spellman's story is probably as good as mine he relates how lothbrock or my lodbrog made a forced landing here in a d eight seventy when driven ashore by a great gale that sprang up suddenly on the jutland coast when he was out alone with his falcons harassing the gulls and guillemots why he did not make yarmouth was because yarmouth's very site was as yet under the sea and full of the fishermen had not yet been born the gale had practically spent itself as he sopped and exhausted hitched a painter to a stump on reedham quay much to the astonishment of the village policeman who after demanding his name and business marched him off to a guard-room the neighbourhood then being under martial law and edmund king of east anglia being then in residence very soon heard of his coming my special historian assured me that there was a falconer in the boat named ludkins who was found lying exhausted in the village and he too was taken ashore and questioned he produced two skewers and a cormorant which had been three parts devoured raw and a couple of peregrine falcons as witnesses to the harmless intentions of his master the king made quite a fuss over the two adventurers giving them much liberty but lodbrog with the swagger of a junker soon made enemies and burn the king's gamekeeper caught him one day with a brace of pheasants in his bag which he had been requested not to interfere with and later he badly mauled one of lord s's gamekeepers which was afterwards denied in the daily mail and moreover he spoilt his reputation by indulging much too freely in the strong norfolk ales in the lord nelson such pranks and ill behaviour from an alien noble so exasperated burn that the latter managed to fire his musket as it were by accident the contents of it lodging in lodbrog's head knocking out a lot of nonsense with his brains i think my historian's tale quite as likely as spellman's as well as his supplementary information that spies wired the news to copenhagen and the outcome of it was that the danish generals hingwa and hubba mustered up twenty thousand men who sailed over burning for revenge and ravaged east anglia ruling the country for many years after at reedham we met several old friends and spent a pleasant evening going the rounds to their several homes in one being initiated into the mysteries of stack building in the farmyard my friend insisting that he had the largest stack in the two counties and we were escorted home to bed aboard the walrus at a rather late hour reedham is a pretty village 
whose dainty bungalows set in apple and flower gardens snugly shelter under a sandy hanger that was undoubtedly a sea cliff when sea waves rolled over the present marsh country bearing the fleets of roman caesars there is yet room for more habitations when the shabby old maltings come down p s the village boasts in holidaying days a butcher's shop on friday morning a rollicking flood tide was slapping the small waves at our hull which made the walrus strain at her moorings so off we went at a famous pace right gladly showing our gait to a sailing wherry almost abreast of us for we were no laggards on a liberal breeze and could kick up a foamy wake at our heels with the best of them the good old year's flood was innocent of weeds a great contrast to the condition of things in nineteen nineteen when even the good punt yarwhelp could scarce move for them and all the time we sailed its waters we did not collect sufficient weeds to make a respectable cabbage or a green bouquet put in at cantsley to have a brief look round at the sugar factory which was a busy hive of men with whom we quite agreed that it would be a famous thing if enough beet could be grown to keep the machinery going all year round looked in at newstead's boat shop and revelled in the timbers and shavings of a fine and fascinating art and the smell of planed oak off again only to lose the breeze which was becoming strangled by the wind baffling trees near buckenham ferry but by a stroke of luck newstead himself now afloat overtook us in a motor-boat and gave us a pluck to coldham hall with its green woody reaches and fleets of gay houseboats, all of them more or less occupied by very wise tenants. It does not appear to be fashionable to go near to Norwich by yachts, for reasons I need scarcely mention, and interest seems to cease beyond Whitlingham. So, as on my last excursion in the punt, I trained to the pleasant old city to rummage the old bookshops, always worth the trouble, and to loiter in the marketplace among the numerous and unconscious wags of quacks and hand sellers. I loved the fringe of a gaping crowd. It was a stuffy and no pleasant day, the atmosphere depressing the skies gloomy as if it had been november when as the eastern daily press next day had it norwich became so overcast that the darkness of the city caused shops and offices everywhere to turn on the electric light some rain fell nature verily cried never in all my years afloat was daylight so early murdered or the dampness of the atmosphere during the night that followed so dense and condensed in august my cabin ceiling and walls ran with water but we took no harm as we had left the cabin doors open i tried to recall any or all my favourite poets who had dealt with such a sort of phenomena for one is glad to think in the dark but every one had evaded it perhaps it does not inspire like evening rainbows by southey moonlight evenings by byron twilights by montgomery hymns to the moon by ben jonson or waterspouts by camoens perhaps a waterspout would have cleared the air the only one who came within an ace of it was william shakespeare who in sunrise after a dark night most dispiritedly wrote 
nowst thou not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe and lights the lower world then thieves and robbers range unseen in murders and in outrage bloody here naturally enough i pulled over the blankets shutting them out our brundle cut where we lay moored was shallow tree sheltered gay with houseboats pleasant for company and swarming with baby roach that flashed in the morning like silvery herring sile surely there ought to be sizable fish in abundance in the river with such myriads of infants in the shallows yet we pass no anglers a fishing to-day nor yesterday what hath come to yare was the river cleaner and sweeter when i was a kiddie fishing for perch at reedham ferry or peering into certain wherry holds under moist sacks and among ice where great bream and roach lay stiff and sylvan by the hundredweight ay and ton when my old friend flea barber of river poaching fame and another or two bold spirits roamed the floods by night and boxed and barrelled sent their netted freights by day by rail to leeds and other cities where jews abound and who hold no opinions against anglers ethics or muddy old bream and taking heed to moses and loving fishers scaled obey his behest that all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers shall be an abomination leviticus chapter two verse nine but for the poachers no norfolk fish has passed their lips what times legitimate fishers once had in norwich streams when as in september eighteen seventeen two norwich gentlemen caught four hundred fish by angling in one day and in august eighteen eleven between six a m and five p m two persons caught by angling near buckenham ferry one hundred and thirty two pounds of perch bream and roach another couple took two hundred and ten pounds mostly bream in one day the first norfolk angling match recorded took place on august the eighteenth eighteen fifty nine near reedham in limpenhoe reach for prizes given by the late c j green total weight of fish taken by twenty-eight competitors in eight hours sixteen stone seven pounds one ounce first prize thirty-three pounds three ounces in november eighteen seventy came greville f to buckenham with his henchman harry crystal finding a swim at the three horseshoes they planted spoles fishing stern to the reeds in five feet of water using gentles as bait we had a bite he wrote mostly a fish at every swim and having filled the bag we emptied the luncheon basket and filled that commencing at twelve noon and leaving off at four p m they mustered a bushel of fish to-day something has gone wrong with the works a perusal of my notes on the downstream return to reedham offers little to enlarge upon and are briefly thus started before noon cold and beautiful for colour as ever a wherry in every pitcher a pitcher in every wherry the rippled waters creased with sun gleams a native venus beside a painted boat dipping her can in the mirror-like water her reflection and pose a pitcher a few weeds like lost doormats accompanying us downstream but no nuisance 
more hens trotting upon massed weeds gathered in reedy bites temperature seventy five degrees at four p m at five teed in a rockland dyke at a pretty corner the broad wild but beautiful in its setting of rank reeds went to the pub hoping to see scientific of dr emerson and dutt the old fellow passed us hurrying along on some bit of wild sport bent and my efforts to hold and pump him failed had i possessed a pewter baiting i think i could have hooked him for the wildest pikes fall to the lure of spoon baits made bright i thought he looked a venerable old chap if not prepossessing nor was his battered old punt which looked a veritable sieve the last time i saw him we chatted on the river but water does not much seem to inspire him and for all his escapades and adventures he had no real ready wit nor gift of spicy yarning and that short spasmodic ha ha of his savours a little too much of fatuous ego he told dr emerson of shooting ospreys or fishhawks of the way they chose a post of observation rising and hovering like a kestrel before a swoop at a fish and its prey was always pike he shot one with a three-pound jack in its talons he told the doctor that he was known as chisels having been a carpenter but if that ratty old punt and rattier houseboat of his be average samples of his output he might have been an antique cabinet maker his environment is as nature wild as himself but emerson's word picture of him in his on english lagoons is honestly worth reading two natives rowing hard on some mysterious errand among the reedy islands which i think was also of some interest to chisels passed us a joke about the ancient we had a pretty bit of sailing on the broad for a little while and then shot through one of the many dykes that drain it to the river then the wind grew tired reached cantley at six forty five a noisy crowd of rooks among the tall treetops wind baffled by the trees so crab clawed around one long bend of reeds wherries lying to for the night reedham ferry at sunset a clear sky creased with a few bars of golden reached reedham in the gloaming and lay to for the night ourselves no cinema church closed no clubs no glaringly lighted parade no public library only a public house or two no flappers no opera house no labour spouters no jail nothing so we repaired to the big room at the lord nelson where reedham's public men foregather it was crowded and i saw life a church organist presided ably at the piano and played national airs snips from operas and catchy tunes the company drank little but smoked much and as soon as the fog be thickened unduly the hero of the evening went back to his walrus and so to bed a merry party from a wherry yacht next door to us set their gramophone a-going and danced to its melodies to the delight of the village constable who hath an ear for music then silence reigned supreme and in the early morning sunday we passed through Haddisco straits to the moorhen's lair at st olive's spending the day without incident End of chapter 13
Chapter Fourteen of the Cruise of the Walrus on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. By Willow Tree Waters. I could see the sun out at one or two holes, but mostly it was big trees all about, and gloomy in there amongst them. There were freckled places in the ground where the light sifted down through the leaves, and the freckled places swapped about a little, showing that there was a little breeze up there. A couple of squirrels sat on a limb and jabbered at me very friendly. From Huckleberry Finn Our run up the sombre Waveney on Monday afternoon afforded no excitements we had a steady enough breeze for the first few miles as we ambled along between dense lank reeds that fringed the river sides interminably and but for the frequent windings the river's monotony would have been somewhat depressing a mill or two and glimpses at friesland cattle now becoming so popular in east anglia occasionally refreshed the eye but of floating company we had none it seems to me that bure is bure and waveney is waveney and only on rare occasions do natives leave their own rivers and it is only when systematic broadland tourists insist on doing the broads thoroughly or racing a tracks that this river is less lonesome there obtains of course a little more liveliness at summer weekends when beckles yachts go down to alton and alton yachts sail up to beckles the only vessel that overhauled us was a hefty motor-boat with a silent skipper aboard we passed with scant comment sloppy borough st peter's with its prospect that never cheers one the old church tower jars every artistic feeling i possess we gave hail to wherryman tooley who was discharging coals at a pump mill that fellow appears always as cheery as a hermit crab that ever has its house at home or abroad to draw into when midway between st peter's and oldby it occurred to me that tea would not come amiss but found our methylated spirits had not been shipped here was a pickle to be in however we called at a little marsh farmhouse squatted behind some trees beside a water-mill where the good woman supplied us with enough to last us up to beckles we moored in the mill deek and break our fasting a queer little lad drew up and began to gossip in broader suffolk our unco craft had set him wondering is that yar boot he asked yes of course i answered did yow copy it no what a yow call it it do fare a funny un i call it a walrus i answered what's a walrust he wanted to know why suffin arter a crocodile i replied ah i ha seed a crocodile in our skull book he went on i ha got nine brothers and sisters i have any eggs i inquired yes my mother ha got some eggs and all do yow want a shillinther yes we'll be glad of them all right i'll fetch em our hens do lay they fare a cacklin now a shillinther he came back with a half dozen splendid eggs we ha got a dog master tied up near the mill he volunteered 
a gun dog whatever for i asked and i can hear him to bark he replied he bark was tied up so i didn't go near him but he do keep thieves off what do they steal said i nothin he replied there aren't nothin to steal and so we chatted to be relieved when the good woman of the mill house called all ten kiddies in to tea he was not exactly silly suffolk but came astonishingly near it one flagrant suffolkian comes to mind said he to a chum who met him and asked what he had got in his handkerchief well jim bought i ha got some mackerel and if yow can tell me how many i ha got yow shall have all five on em jim thought a moment and scratched his head then replied oive well bore said the other handing them over that's a rummin that's just the wery number i hev got in the grey of late eventide we rode a little farther alderby wards and picking out as cosy a corner in the reeds as possible staked down the swallows from the mill flew fitfully around in the mist snatching midges and gnats for their suppers a flock of starlings from their foray on the moist marshes on rustling wings passed over the tree-tops in a compact company to drop in a chattering crowd among some dense rushes where they gradually quietened down and so swallows and starlings and crew settled down for the night's repose and the mists thickened and blanketed down all nature hard by us lost in the gloom lay a wherry whose crew turned in with a cheery good night and all was still as the grave silence reigned complete at nine the next morning the mists melted and dispersed and rolled away as if being shepherded by some unseen hand progress was slow for every willow stole the wind that we wanted so we put out the oars giving them a rest as we came to each gap where a breeze would filter through it looked extremely odd how the awakened swallows resorted to the treetops we passed one sallow on the topmost twigs of which these birds alighted in clusters restlessly enough too for a swarm of insects had also chosen resting places there among under a clear sky the translucent river slithered along almost without a ripple and the trees that overhung it were reflected to the topmost leaves a very beautiful effect for the trees above and the trees below were equally distant to the eye then there came a cat's paw of wind a perceptible rippling of the surface the slim treetops waved rhythmically and the reeds below nodded good day to each other and as through oldbury bridge and by curving ways the stream went so did we rejoicing in the lively awakening of the breeze at boater's hill gillingham we pulled up for dinner and a pleasant yarn with a lowestoft friend who was a holidaying too when clambering the slope to get some milk at the farm a large ash tree stump attracted my attention and with my necktie i measured around it just above the soil and then its diameter and on comparing lengths of the tie with a tape measure in the boat i found it twenty-eight feet round 
and eight feet through it the natives assured me that it had been felled for fear of falling on a cottage at its foot and now for picturesque sleepy beckles where no one appears in a hurry to live or die here was exhibited the same old apathy the same whimsically crooked streets the same rich mellow artistic picture when viewed from the river in a sunny light the same monotonous army of trees that meet the river near the town and escort it by squads and companies right away to Gelderston and farther along all its windings as if afraid that the very breathing of summer winds through its leafy ways should mar its peacefulness the very boaters rowed with apathetic habitude and the people in the streets appeared to loiter rather than progress on the flagstones i have wondered in my own mind if the little township's motto could be cogito ergo sum i think therefore i exist after a jostle through the drowsy town i returned to the public apology for a yachting stave where nobody seems to moor unless obliged to and the skipper had orders to heave the rond anchor from its hole in the stone heap and make for gelderston we literally sighed for a wind and used our oars a la smacksman a fellow leaned on the bridge to look at us another turned his head and turned it back again on and on we crawled more like slug than walrus now to the right now to the left as the corners bent where the light sifted down through the leaves and the freckled places swapped about a little and so until our arms alternatively ached and the drowsy river having seemingly repented its upward movement stood still then it turned with the haste of a land snail and seemed to ask us why your hurry so finding that it did not look like reaching the lock that night we reversed our engine and let the ship swing round and being now wholly resigned let her go back upon an ebb that dawdled rather than ran so loafing and idling with a hand upon the tiller we got back at some time or other to the staging again macgregor in his voyage alone in the yawl rob roy describes a state of feeling under similar circumstances says he the effect was to bring the mind and body into a curious condition of subdued life a sort of contemplative oriental placid state in which both cares and pleasures ceased to be acute and the flight of time seemed gliding and even and not marked by the distinct epochs which define our civilised life perhaps a mollusk could affirm as much of its existence o dodman of a walrus we snugged down early even as dusk fell upon the river and the one weak lamp shot forth its feeble glow at the far end of the quay not so much to guide late yachts folk to their berths but simply to warn pedestrians that a river runs hard by it rained determinedly through the night and left most things limp and moist on the morning of tuesday so i paid my shilling harbour dues to a gentleman who seemed half apologetic in taking it and actually handed me a receipt for it we left the walrus to take care of the staging my skipper to train for lowestoft myself for gelderston where on arriving i strode away to the marsh road 
that shone with puddles and slopped with ooze the only dry stretch of it being afforded by a native macadamizing of it with fathoms of potato hulms which was as soft as turkey carpet the only road to compare with it is at caister west end on the way to morby where i have seen the marsh road paved with decaying swede turnips Gelderston had long been a lure to me and my first sight of it was like a well rinsed watercolour over the lock gates rushed a sort of cascade into the lower level due to last night's heavy rain it must be a beautiful corner of the waveney under friendly skies and even to-day a wary load of artists were breakfasting where the yachts lie too under to-day's unhappy sky was an effect they should be stealing for of sunny broadland pictures there seems some glut why so rarely a storm cloud or a study of subdued lights i had a chat inside the old public house finding the landlord cheery it stands in a ring of trees and is so near the bank that it reflects itself in the clear waters inside it offers a comfortable parlour with a promising fireside around which i'll warrant forgather merry knots of labour-worn yokels when work has ceased while many a story sends the loud laugh round the publican explained to me the working of the lock and showed his simple eel net in shape the pattern of the trawl net the long square of its entry with the cone-shaped net attached to it and there you are and when the eels are running for the sea and the backwaters are let through the side sluice all the fish is expected to do is to run into the cone of it to be held there by the stream until the worker lifts and empties it just as richard lubbock's description of a duck decoy is the best extent to this day so dr emerson in on english lagoons gives us the most vivid word picture of working the eel net in december eighteen ninety in bitter winterly weather he lay here in the maid of the mist at gelderston on a pitch dark night the aged keeper tapped at his cabin window i have just drawn them nets sir he said and showed the doctor thither with a lantern says emerson a mass of beautiful silver eels lay wriggling at the bottom amongst the green weed their backs seaweed green their bellies shining like silver they were in splendid condition too fat and frolicsome there were twenty pounds of them at ten twenty they made another sally i held the lantern over the roaring foaming waters that shone with ghostly gleam against the black sky the lock-keeper leant over the handrail and thrust his chrome into the torrent feeling for a pod they were both swollen with fish he drew one of the pods upstream it was taut and heavy with eels i could see that weird picture as i thought of emerson's description leaning over the rail he could write vivid english when he was not facetious or puerile just fancy yourself there in pitchy darkness a gloom intensified by the flickering lantern with the temperature at thirty nine degrees fahrenheit emptying that unexpectedly large take of many stones of eels running up to three pounds each and at so late a period of the year when most old eelmen will tell you in snowy water they'd never heard tell of such a thing the publican when asked of other fishes that came to his nets beside eels 
mentioned a trout of seven pounds and another spotted beauty much heavier as well as a chub of one pound a fish which seems rare in the waveney indeed lubbock in his fauna speaks of it as totally unknown in the bure the year and i believe the waveney but of the higher part of this last river i am not sure in april eighteen ninety when rowing on this river at bungay i picked up a dead chub measuring eleven and a half inches in length and was pleased to hear of this more recent example the chub loves brisk waters rather than lakes wherein it does not greatly thrive otherwise i would that they swarmed in the broads to give anglers a change of sport from hauling out the everlasting slimy bream and endless processions of baby roaches otherwise the chub is no great loss for its flesh is poor enough says blakey perhaps the best way of serving up the chub would be to imitate the irish manager's method of performing hamlet send up the richest receipt you can get hot and piquant omitting the fish a friend of mine had taken by babbing a nice lot of eels at gelderston leaving them in the bucket on the bank he turned in for a nap to wake up in the morning to find a considerable quantity missing and a dog skulking around suspiciously its body remarkably distended as my informant remarked it stood out like a balloon his suspicions being aroused he called on the lock keeper who admitted his dog had a great liking for eels devouring them alive never mind said he i'll get you some to make up for em and at once set the net across the sluiceway and made a scoop of half a stone of eels to replace the lost ones the marshman's dog like the broadsman's sow is often piscivoriously inclined and now for dinner and away again End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the cruise of the walrus on the broads by arthur henry patterson this librivox recording is in the public domain then alton and home thus thoughtfully we were rowing homeward to find some autumnal work to do and help on the revolution of the seasons perhaps nature would condescend to make use of us even without our knowledge as when we help to scatter her seeds in our walks and carry burrs and cockles on our clothes from field to field by thoreau late on the morning of tuesday under a drizzling sky we got under way again taking the ebb with us and making use of every favourable slant of wind which to its credit behaved increasingly kindly as we got into the more open country very little excitement varied the run down beyond a chat with the old bee bridge man and a dinner disposed of as we jogged along at the old bee pump house i ran the boat's nose into the bank and jumped ashore attracted by the number of busy swallows dashing in and out of it the two fellows at work with the engines in that lonely corner of suffolk were glad enough of a chat with a stranger and were only too pleased to talk of their swallows whose nests were stuck in most inconceivable niches and corners some under rafters above the rattling machinery others under the below foot trap doors where we walked and some actually hung suspended 
over a torrent of rushing waters that foamed but a foot or two below them and even in dusty black corners in the coal shed in a gloom that was almost as sable as the coals half filling the area even as we looked and peeped around the old birds flew in and out certainly with a slight show of agitation as they saw in me a stranger whom they had not become accustomed to then off we set sail again the walrus showing her enjoyment at the brisk breeze that bellied the sail and made the mile speed under her keel right merrily this fresh of wind held us until we reached Alton Dyke, up which, tack upon tack against a still ebbing tide, we slapped the old tub along, now her port gunwale perilously near the water, and now the starboard side getting it right sloppily. Two or three yachts flew by with a favourable wind behind them, their owners merrily greeting us, and then subsiding into their cockpits to see that their own sailing was above criticism from the two voyageurs who were fast becoming tolerable navigators and seamen. But the air was, to me, as cold as in winter. My fingers were benumbed, and I was chilled thoroughly. We ran the old walrus straight across the broad, and halted her at the bank at the extreme end of my good friend Everett's railings, hard by a grotesque but comfortable old boathouse, whose owner came out to caution us against the vagaries of the tidal shallows where we had moored. This elderly gentleman suggested some original copy, but I soon discovered that he was not only a rung or two above an ordinary eelman's stature, but a man of some repute and standing in the world artistic, and remarkably well preserved for his age. Are you he who came here a while ago in the Yarwelp punt? he asked. I owned to it, and on his mentioning my name, I asked for his. T. F. Goodall, he answered. Bless me, I remember you in Dr. Emerson's Electra, moored in 1890 in a Braden drain. You painted the picture of Yarmouth. Emerson wrote Wildlife on a Tidal Water. That's it, said he, as I jumped ashore for a handshake. And with two of your paintings in Yarmouth Museum, I said. So we set to work to reminiscate, going aboard to continue our chat, which was mostly his, and I assumed my usual role of listener when afloat. I had never credited the story in the doctor's book of Pintail Thomas whom he accuses of letting two or three gentlefolk drown from an overturned boat, whilst he, Thomas, stayed in his gun punt sculling around after a curlew sandpiper, Tringa subaquata, utterly heedless of the disaster. When Dr. Emerson expostulated with the little punt gunner, the fellow merely remarked, Well, sir, them warmen don't know much about small boat sailing. Sarve em right if they come up here and get drownded. That did happen, said Mr. Goodall, who went on with his chat on art, on pictures, and on many other things that were beloved of both of us. The walrus was herself again completely on these open waters, where a draught from the sea sets the moored yachts a-dancing and tugging at their lariats like frisky colts. So we let her run again, to dodge in and out among the moored yachts that crowded the waters, more than one crew eyeing us askance as we approached alarmingly near, 
and then suddenly put her on to another tack in almost half her own length with a good breeze the walrus enjoys herself who has learnt to know all her individual peculiarities really we were hunting for the houseboat of my friend carradus yachting specialist for the county paper ere long we found him and hitched our mooring rope to a buoy hard by the walrus at once putting her nose towards the sea breeze to swing head to wind as boats do at alton and moving to meet it from whatever direction it chooses to come or on the tide if need be in a calm the dinghy flory had been left at st olives having been more of an encumbrance than a help seeing that the mother ship is but five feet longer than this small craft hence we had to hail carradus who came over for us with his larger dinghy and we spent an hour or so chatting in his cabin it was now dark and the breeze had strengthened to half a gale and even more as a squall burst upon the broad which churned up the waters and made all the lighter craft ramp at their moorings at ten it occurred to me that we might have still more stormy weather so carradus agreed to row us back to the walrus but when a boat's length away we could make no progress at all and we were drenched by the rainfall in a few moments we had nothing to do but to spurt back to the houseboat and there await the first lull when we soon got aboard our ship to lie rocking the night long wondering at a more than usual gust whether we should not be on a lee shore by morning carradus's dinghy and all but we weathered it on wednesday we were met by a fairly decent morning so after breakfast all of us rode to the commodore's stave the skipper betaking himself to lowestoft regatta myself going to the fish wharf for a whiff of the salt seaweed and a smell of freshly landed sea fish i was at home here threading the lanes between piles of roca and place and codfishes the first named lying like soft slabs one upon the other weeping slime from every pore as the wharfingers sorted or packed them the last mentioned lying in contorted heaps with mouths agasp as if death had overtaken them by painful suffocation their great listless eyes coldly staring here were boxes of dabs and there trunks of goggle-eyed haddocks whilst heaps of the latter were being beheaded by strong wrists that wrenched head and body apart thick hearty turbot lay piled upon each other meat dainties for older manic palates and dainty souls that would have tempted the sorriest invalid to dine upon them without misgiving i looked for sturgeon porpoise or any other uncommon catch but none was there nor mackerel nor sea trout but grotesque latchets or saffarine gurnards none too rotund and some other common species varied the tons of prime and offal two naked and headless species were dumped down upon the pavements or half hidden in tubs the sea angler and the dogfish the latter bereft of skin and head and spines as well there remains to-day but scant call for dogs and cats or wolf-fish and anglerfish lophius piscatorius as obtained in wartime when all was fish that came to the nets not that they are less nourishing as then but prejudice forbids their being sold knowingly and in their jackets to the populace 
so as fried fish or as smoked grimsby haddock they find their way still upon many a table making the quaint old saying true that what the eye does not see the heart does not grieve over it is odd to me that one never sees the ordinary eel sold on the fish markets those who capture them as eelmen preferring to send their catches straight to billingsgate or to private buyers and in all my sailings around on this trip i saw but one solitary eel babber and he being apparently very restless in changing his pictures suggested himself as the merest amateur or that eels were not on the feed yet some of these waters teem with large eels not so long ago i went late one night to a certain private water and put in with two boon companions three dozen liggers each baited with a small dead roach whose bladder had been pricked by a bait needle so that it sank a bit of flat wood two inches by six painted white had five or six yards of strong twine wound round it with the exception of some four feet a hook with a length of snood was attached to the end of this line by a peculiar half knot or half bow an operation most difficult to explain simple enough when once learnt yet easy to forget these liggers were dropped at intervals and left until morning when soon after daybreak they were retrieved one man rowing another searching for the floats which on a slight ripple of water are difficult to distinguish those that have not been visited by an eel seldom drift far from the spot where they had been thrown in occasionally a float was seen moving about mysteriously on the surface and it went without saying it held a prisoner a missing float naturally was sought for and would be found at the side of the lake against the reeds or sedges and almost invariably held a large eel which had managed most likely to become entangled among the vegetation if among reeds it had to be left but if ensnared among softer rooted sedges it was not difficult to haul out roots and eel together a little care had to be exercised in hauling in a three-pound eel that had been hooked later than one which had been somewhat exhausted by a longer struggle on bringing it to the surface a neat and dexterous lift into the boat prevented it catching its tail under the boat as an eel invariably tries to do and so make escape possible a pull at the short end of the snood releases the hook and down fall fish and snood into a box to flop about for a bit and then settle to threading itself in and under and among his chums already hauled in a dozen fat eels ranging from two pounds to three pounds weight was not a bad capture and there was something if not exactly sporty about a liggering escapade that had at least a poacher-like flavour seeing the fun takes place at either end of night and still waters have a quieting effect upon those busily occupied in the adventure there was always a fascination about the habits of eels for me something bewitching about their haunts as well as the exercising of the various methods of their capture whether by eel set spear or bab or ligger or nightline or by whipping i have tried the latter on a norfolk broad with some success a long willow wand is stuck in a shallow spot with a line and baited hook attached to it it was odd early next morning to see two or three lines rotating around their individual rod that 
from its springiness gave and took with no fear of a breakage ancient Elian seems to have enjoyed the sport of catching eels but his methods would not make appeal to a modern angler he tells us an eel fisher would use some cubits length of a sheep's intestines throwing it in the water the eel seizing the nether end he then blows in it the gut swelling and so is held by the fish's teeth hardly so pleasant an experience as that of the saxon boys whom our forefathers chastised with whips made of eel skins a punishment evidently learnt from the roman whose boy looked upon eels as a scourge for the body rather than as a dainty for his palate and for all the excellent stews eels will make their capture and handling become more or less of a penance from a recent fishing gazette i culled the following song of hate for eels oh the slimy squirmy slithery eel he swallows your hook with malignant zeal he tangles your line and he gums your reel the slimy squirmy slithery eel oh the slimy squirmy slithery eel he cannot be held in a grip of steel and when he is dead he is hard to peel the slimy squirmy slithery eel oh the slimy squirmy slithery eel the sorriest catch in the angler's creel he never was fit for a christian meal the slimy squirmy slithery eel oh the slimy squirmy slithery eel malevolent serpent who dares reveal what eloquent fishermen say and feel concerning the slimy slithery eel it was now time to belt ship for home waters and bring the voyage to an end after sundry calls upon friends we hoisted sail again and fairly rollicked off the broad to the waveney on a lusty breeze that carried us without a grumble to haddisco bridge which shut in our faces and was closed so long that we wearied of tacking up and down for a solid twenty minutes during which time the wind true to itself gave out and in a remarkably short time it had become an absolute calm forcing us to creep at a sickly snail's pace between the wooden bridge piles and even slower than that in accomplishing the last five hundred yards to the moorhen's ditch cut so ended the slowest broadland expedition i ever accomplished but who grumbles the time had sped pleasantly one's health had been improved upon and if patience be one of the highly esteemed virtues i had learnt to become at least passably moral and i still agree with the poet channing that the river calmly flows through shining banks through lonely glen where the owl shrieks though ne'er the cheer of men hath stirred its mute repose still if you should walk there you would go there again End of chapter 15 End of the Cruise of the Walrus on the Broads by Arthur Henry Patterson